So in this video, we're going to cover chapter three, looking at functional anatomy of prokaryotic cells. And in the next unit, we'll move on to chapter four, which is looking at eukaryotic cells. But for the purpose of this one, we're going to look at prokaryotic cells first. So what you saw in the video was this big giant blob here. This was a white blood cell and it was chasing a bacterium. And so what we're going to learn throughout this unit is how were these cells able to do all of these different things? For example, how was the white blood cell able to move? How did it know where the bacteria was? Why did it engulf the bacteria, meaning doing a process called phagocytosis to take in that foreign invader? Why was it able to recognize that the bacteria was foreign? And the red blood cells, which are these circular cells here, that those cells were self. How did it recognize the difference between them? And so as we kind of move throughout this unit looking at prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells, you'll really start to gain an understanding of how did these cells do these different things? What was it that allowed them to do these different things? So what we're going to do to start off is we are going to talk about what are structures that are found in all cells, because then we will start to break down how prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells are different. But first, we're going to start with what do all cells have in common. And the first thing is that all cells have a plasma or cell membrane. And this is a phospholipid bilayer, and it separates the living cell from the non-living environment. Now, sometimes students want to say that all cells have a cell wall. That is not true. Not all cells have a cell wall. Animal cells, for example, do not have a cell wall. Um, protozoan cells do not have a cell wall. So we can't say cell walls, but we can say all cells have a cell or plasma membrane. All cells have chromosomes, and chromosomes are the DNA molecules that carry the genes. The genes are going to be the hereditary information, meaning those are the sequences of DNA that code for some functional product. Typically that product is going to be that it's coding for a protein, in other cases, it's coding for a type of RNA, but it codes for some sort of functional product. And so all cells have chromosomes. They all have to have some form of genetic material. All cells have ribosomes. And the ribosome is an organelle that's used to synthesize, which is another word for make, proteins. All cells have to be able to synthesize proteins because proteins do a variety of different things within the cell. They act as enzymes to speed up chemical reactions. They allow cells to communicate. They allow cells to get molecules into the cell because those proteins can act as channels in the membrane, etc. Proteins are absolutely essential, therefore all cells have to be able to make proteins, and therefore they all have ribosomes. So whether it's bacterial cells or plant cells or animal cells, they all are going to have ribosomes. And then lastly, all cells have cytosol. And cytosol is the semi-fluid substance inside the cell membrane. And this cytosol, this fluid, is primarily water. About 70 to 95 percent of the cytosol is water and the rest is going to be macromolecules, et cetera, ions, et cetera, that are dissolved in the cytosol. So all cells have a cell membrane, chromosomes, ribosomes, and cytosol. So those are things that are found in all cells. Now we're gonna break down and talk about how are cells different? What do different cells have that make them different from one another? So when we refer to a prokaryotic cell, 
prokaryotic cell comes from the Greek word for pre-nucleus, meaning prokaryotic cells do not have a membrane-bound nucleus. Their DNA is not contained within a separate membrane inside the cell. In a prokaryotic cell, the cell membrane is their membrane. They don't have a separate membrane that surrounds their genetic information. Eukaryotic cell comes from the Greek word for true nucleus. A eukaryotic cell is one that has a membrane-bound nucleus. It has a membrane that surrounds the genetic information. So if we compare and contrast prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells contain one or few, not many though, one or a few circular chromosomes. So it's a circle. This chromosome is not in a membrane. Again, it's not separated by a membrane like we see for eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells have chromosomes that are paired. So like if you think about us, for example, humans, we have 46 chromosomes. Those 46 chromosomes are arranged into 23 pairs, meaning 23 of your chromosomes came from mom, 23 chromosomes came from dad. We reproduce using sexual reproduction. Prokaryotic cells do not. Prokaryotic cells simply do asexual reproduction. So their chromosomes are not paired. But eukaryotic cells have paired chromosomes. Those paired chromosomes are linear, meaning they're long strands. They don't connect in a circle. So they're linear chromosomes. And they are contained within a nuclear membrane, meaning there's a separate membrane that surrounds the genetic information. So prokaryotic cells, one or a few circular chromosomes not in a membrane. Eukaryotic cells, paired chromosomes that are linear, and they are separated by a nuclear membrane. Prokaryotic cells do not have histones. Histones are a type of protein that DNA wraps around and when the DNA wraps around it, it allows the DNA to pack in very tightly. Prokaryotic cells, their DNA is not especially large, and therefore they don't necessarily need histone proteins, whereas eukaryotic cells have extremely long DNA sequences. If you were to take the DNA of one of your single cells out of the cell, so let's say we looked at our cheek cell, that cell is microscopic. You have to use a microscope to see it. However, if you took the DNA out of one single cheek cell and lined up your 46 chromosomes end to end, meaning single file, that DNA would stretch over six feet long. So taller than me would be how long that DNA would be. And that DNA is able to pack in that teeny tiny cell that's microscopic. And so histones help facilitate that. They help the DNA to pack in very tightly. Prokaryotic cells do not have membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotic cells do. They have membrane-bound organelles. So they have structures like mitochondria, chloroplasts, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, etc. Other organelles, these little tiny organs within the cell, that serve a specific function. Eukaryotic cells have them, prokaryotic cells do not. In terms of cell wall, again, not all cells have a cell wall. However, in prokaryotic cells, the cell wall is made of peptidoglycan. Peptido refers to protein, glycan refers to sugar. So in the case of bacteria, their cell wall is made of this peptidoglycan. It's this protein sugar mix. Most bacteria have peptidoglycan in their cell walls. There are some exceptions, but again, we're gonna go with general rules. In archaea, if you recall back to chapter one when we talked about archaea, archaea are prokaryotic cells. They are typically, they're more likely to be what we call extremophiles, meaning they live in extreme environments. And in the case of archaea, their cell walls are made of something called pseudomurin. It's actually very similar to peptidoglycan. It is still protein sugar mix, 
but it is in fact distinct from peptidoglycan. And so that's something that's different between bacteria and archaea. In terms of eukaryotic cell walls, eukaryotic cell walls, if they have them, again, not all do, they would be made of typically polysaccharides. Polysaccharides means many sugars linked together. For fungi, this would be chitin. And for plants and algae, this would be cellulose. These are both polysaccharides, and they're both found in cell walls in eukaryotic cells. Now again, in eukaryotic cells, not all categories of eukaryotic cells have a cell wall. Animal cells don't. Protozoans don't, right? But if they do have it, typically it's going to be made of polysaccharide. It's many sugars linked together. In terms of the way that cells replicate, in prokaryotic cells, cells divide by a process referred to as binary fission. It's an asexual type of reproduction where the DNA is going to duplicate and then it's going to divide into two cells. In eukaryotic cells, when cells go to replicate, they will still replicate. However, the process through which they replicate is different. Eukaryotic cells will move chromosomes using something called a mitotic spindle. This does not happen in prokaryotic cells, but it does happen in eukaryotic cells. And so there are some differences in the way that cells divide. So what we have here is we have a table comparing and contrasting eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. And so what I'm gonna have you do, and then we're gonna discuss this in Zoom, is I'm gonna have you fill this in and I want you to record, so for example, for nucleus, you wanna record for eukaryotic cells either yes or no in terms of the nucleus. So eukaryotic cells, do they have a nucleus? Yes or no? Prokaryotic cells, do they have a nucleus? Yes or no? Same thing with membrane-bound organelles, yes or no? Ribosomes, yes or no? Cell membranes, yes or no? Cell wall, yes or no? And also sh you should be specific and say if they do have a cell wall, what would it be made of for eukaryotic cells versus prokaryotic cells? And then lastly, we have cell size. So basically what this is asking is which one is typically larger and which one is typically smaller. So think about when we did our cheek cell smears, for example, right? Were our cheek cell size bigger, larger, or smaller than the bacteria that was on that slide? So one of them you're gonna write larger and the other you're gonna write smaller. And so you wanna fill this in and then we will have a discussion on Zoom to go over this answer together. So we are going to look at a functional anatomy of prokaryotes. Look at structures within a prokaryotic cell and talk about what these different structures do. So in terms of prokaryotic cells, most bacteria have an average size of about one micrometer or one micron in terms of size. If we're talking about a cocci, which is a sphere, they have a circumference going around of approximately one micron in size. If we're talking about rods like E. coli, the rods typically will have a length of about two micrometers in size and a width of about one micrometer. But on average, right, they're about one micrometer in size. If we were to talk about a red blood cell, just to give you an idea of scale, a red blood cell would have a size of approximately 7.5 micrometers in size. Now, most bacteria are what we call monomorphic. Mono refers to one, morph refers to shape. These are bacteria that have one shape, meaning if they're rod, they are always rod-shaped bacteria. However, there are a few bacteria that are pleomorphic. 
meaning they have many shapes. So their shape can change. For example, Kareni bacteria. They have a type of structure, a shape, that can change. And this, this is a variation in the size and the shape of the cell of a single species due to nutritional and genetic differences. So depending on the resources that are available, that can influence the shape of that bacteria. And so that would be a type of bacteria that would be pleomorphic. It has many shapes. Again, pleomorphic would be much more rare. There aren't as many bacteria that do that. Most bacteria are monomorphic. They have one shape. So if we talk about basic shapes of prokaryotic cells, we can have a rod-shaped bacteria, which we refer to as bacillus. So singular, we say bacillus. If we are talking about a group of rod-shaped bacteria, the plural would be bacilli. Instead of the U-S, it's an I. So bacilli would be plural for rod-shaped bacteria. If we refer to bacteria as being caucus shaped. Caucus shaped is going to be spherical. They're spheres or round. Caucus is going to be singular. Plural is going to be cocci. So cocci would be the plural. Now notice when we're talking about shapes here, when we talk about shapes, we're talking about bacteria's morphology. Morphology is their shape. So they could be bacillus shaped, they could be caucus shaped, or they could be a spiral. And so if we look at different types of spirals, we can have what's called a vibrio. And a vibrio is a curved rod. It kind of reminds me of a comma. So that would be a vibrio. A spirillum is a type of spiral, but it's a rigid helical shape. Think of it like if you've seen old telephone cords, right, that have that rigid um, spiral, that would be like spirillum. It has this rigid helical shape. That's in contrast to spirochete, which is going to be a flexible helical shape. Notice it's not a perfect corkscrew, it's not a perfect spiral, and in fact, that helix is very flexible. So these are different types of morphology that bacteria can have. And so typically, most commonly, they're going to be one of these types. Now, when you see bacillus, you need to be careful because there is a genus, so a group of organisms, that are bacillus. So for example, if we talk about bacillus anthracis or bacillus cereus, Bacillus is the genus. That's the group of bacteria. There is also bacillus, the shape, right? And bacillus, the shape, is going to be the rod-shaped bacteria. Now, within genus bacillus, so within this genus, bacteria are also bacillus-shaped. So those go hand in hand. But not all bacteria that are bacillus-shaped, meaning not all rod bacteria, is in the genus bacillus. The genus bacillus is gram-positive. And if we think about bacteria in the gut, for example, like Escherichia coli, those are rod-shaped bacteria. But Escherichia is the genus. The genus is not bacillus. So you have to be really careful when you're looking at bacillus to figure out is somebody talking about the shape bacillus or are they talking about the scientific name, the genus bacillus. If you see it italicized, you're referring to the genus. If it is not italicized, it's referring to the shape. And so that's typically a good way to distinguish between them. Or remember that for scientific names, if they're handwritten, meaning they're not typed, bacillus would be underlined. And that's how you would know it's the scientific name. Again, that would not be the case for the shape. So 
all bacteria in the genus Bacillus are bacillus shaped, but not all bacillus shaped bacteria are in the genus Bacillus. So you have to be really careful with when you're talking about bacillus, are you talking about the shape or are you talking about the genus? There are some unusually shaped bacteria that don't fall into one of those main categories that we're talking about. An example of this is the star-shaped bacteria that was discovered that is part of this genus Stella. And this was a type of bacteria that was discovered in the tundra in the ice in Russia. And so they discovered this unique bacteria that has this kind of star shape. This is different, right, than many of the other shapes that we've seen. Some bacteria are rectangular. They almost look like little boxes. And they might appear more like a plant cell. Plant cells often look more boxy. There are some bacteria that are also rectangular. These would be part of the genus Halo Arcula. Now, in addition to shape or morphology, we can also talk about bacteria, bacterial arrangements, meaning how do they grow in terms of groups. So if they are paired, pair is going to be diplo. Di means two. So we could have diplococci or we could have diplobacilli. So they're paired up. We could have clusters. Clusters, the arrangement is referred to as staphylo. So staphylo are grape-like clusters. Caucus is referring to spheres. So we have these grape-like clusters of spherical-shaped bacteria. Now, you're not going to see staphylobacilli. You're not going to see clusters of bacillus-shaped bacteria. And that's because simply when these rod-shaped bacteria go to reproduce, they only divide along their horizontal axis, meaning they only divide out. They don't divide any other direction. So you're not going to see staphylobacilli, but you will see staphylococci. If the bacteria is in chains, chains would be strepto. So we could have streptococci, so these are chains of spheres, or we could have streptobacilli, which are chains of bacillus shaped. And so this is the arrangement. So the cocci or the bacilli, those are the morphologies. The prefix, the part that comes before that, is the bacteria's arrangement, meaning how are multiple bacteria grouped together. So what we're going to look at is we're going to start to kind of take a tour of a prokaryotic cell and talk about the different structures that are found in a prokaryotic cell. So what you're looking at in this diagram, and I know this is super small, but these are the types of images that are in your textbook. Um, but what you're looking at here on the left, these are structures that are found in all bacteria. So again, you'll notice that the structures that you see there are going to be the cell membrane, the bacterial chromosome, ribosomes, cytoplasm, or cytosol. Those again are structures found in all cells. So they're not just found in all prokaryotic cells, they're actually found in all cells, but in fact, they're found in all prokaryotic cells as well. Notice that these structures on the right are only found in some bacteria meaning they're found in certain types of bacteria, but they're not found in all bacteria. So we will talk about an S layer, we'll talk about fimbriae, the outer membrane, cell wall, cytoskeleton, pili, glycocalyx, inclusions, etc. We are gonna go through and talk about a lot of these other structures that are found in only certain bacteria. And we'll talk about what do each of these structures do for a prokaryotic cell. So I like this diagram because it really starts to break down kind of where are these structures located. So the first set of structures would be external structures, things that are on the outside of the bacterial cell. So 
We have what are called appendages, so things that are coming out from the bacterial cell wall. This would be things like flagella, which is used for motility. We have pili, which are used for something called conjugation, for motility, etc. We have fimbriae. Fimbriae are used for attachment. We have nanowires and nanotubes. We're not going to get into those as much in this lecture. We will talk about surface layers, so structures on the outside of the cell wall. This would include what we call an S layer, and we will also talk about glycocalyx. Then we will talk about the boundary, meaning kind of the transition between the inside of the cell and the outside being the external structures. So this is right along that boundary. So this would include an outer membrane if you're talking about gram-negative bacteria. This would include a cell wall. This would include the cytoplasmic membrane. And then we will also talk about internal structures. So cytoplasm, ribosomes, inclusions, nucleoid or chromosomes, um, cytoskeleton, endospores, plasmids, microcompartments, etc. And so we will walk through and talk about what do these different structures do? What is their purpose in a bacterial cell? So we are going to start with our external structures first. So we're going to go from the outside in. And in fact, we will actually do the cell membrane and cell wall at the end. So we're going to do external structures first, then go inside and then go to the boundary. So starting with external structures, we have our glycocalyx. Glycocalyx is a gelatinous external layer that is made of polysaccharide or polypeptide. Polysaccharide, again, is going to be sugar-based. Polypeptide is going to be protein-based. Polypeptide is much less common. However, it is found in Bacillus anthracis, which is the bacteria that causes anthrax. And Bacillus anthracis has a glycocalyx that is made of D-glutamic acid. Now, the reason that that's important is that because it's made of this amino acid and the amino acid is in its D-isoform, the L-isoform of glutamic acid is the one that's more prevalent in nature, meaning that's the one you see more commonly. Because Bacillus anthracis has a glycocalyx made of D-glutamic acid, which is not the typical amino acid, it's a variation, it's an isoform, because its glycocalyx is made of this unique D-glutamic acid, the immune system can't digest it. It doesn't recognize that and it's not able to digest it. And as a result, that gives Bacillus anthracis an advantage being in the body because its outer layer can't be digested by our immune cells. And it's because it has this unique glycocalyx that is made of D-glutamic acid. Now, when we talk about types of glycocalyx, we can break it down into two categories. The first type of glycocalyx would be referred to as a slime. And in a slime, it's loosely organized and attached to the cell. So you'll notice that it's not highly organized, it's not tightly ad adhered to the cell, it's just kind of loosely attached. That's in contrast to a capsule. In lab, we talked about a capsule stain. And a capsule is a highly organized type of glycocalyx, and it is tightly attached to the cell. So that's what makes it different from being a slime. They are both glycocalyx. However, they are a little bit different in terms of their structure. So now let's talk about what are the functions of a slime or a capsule layer? What are the functions of the glycocalyx? So first, the glycocalyx is there to prevent dehydration and nutrient loss. So to protect bacteria from drying out and to protect it from losing or not getting enough nutrients. It functions as an adherence factor, meaning it's sticky 
and it helps bacteria to adhere to surfaces. This can allow it to produce what's called a biofilm. And when bacteria are arranged in a biofilm, which we'll talk more about in a minute, it's this complex intermicrobial community. When bacteria are in these biofilms, antibiotics are up to a thousand times less likely to work if bacteria form a biofilm. So it gives bacteria a major advantage to be resistant to antibiotics and to disinfectants. And so forming this biofilm is protective for the bacteria. Protects bacteria from phagocytosis. Again, bacillus anthracis is going to produce a capsule of that D-glutamic acid. And as a result, one, either it, the white blood cells, the phagocytes are not able to do phagocytosis, or if they do phagocytosis, they're not able to digest it because the immune system does not recognize that D-glutamic acid. And then lastly, we have that it's a virulence factor. And what that means is it has the ability to cause disease. So an example of this would be Streptococcus pneumoniae. There are different strains of Streptococcus pneumoniae. And when we talk about genetics, we'll talk about a process referred to as transformation. And what you'll see is that bacteria that produce a capsule are able to cause disease in mice, meaning they're able to cause the mice to die of pneumonia. But the same bacteria, the Streptococcus pneumoniae, that does not produce the capsule does not cause disease and the mouse would survive. And so this capsule or this glycocalyx is a virulence factor. It has the ability to cause disease. And so again, down here, this picture is an example of a capsule stain, which we looked at, right? The background is stained with the Congo red because Congo red is a negative stain and the negative stain is repelled by the negatively charged cell. And this cell in the middle is stained with the safranin because safranin is a basic stain. The basic stain has a positive charge and therefore it's attracted to the negatively charged cell. And the capsule ends up being the colorless part, right? So this white part here is the capsule. And so these are just the functions of this glycocalyx. Now, again, bacteria that can produce this capsule or this slime can lead to what is referred to as a biofilm. And again, a biofilm is a complex intermicrobial community that's living in slime. And so what you have is you have some surface and that surface might have some sort of organic surface coating. So teeth, for example, can form a biofilm. And what happens is, is that you need these first colonists to come along, and these first colonists are able to produce that glycocalyx. They're able to produce that capsule or that slime, and it allows them to stick to, for example, the surface of the teeth. And so the bacteria will adhere, they'll stick to the surface of the teeth, and that will recruit more bacteria to the biofilm. And so those bacteria are going to send out basically these chemical signals that are going to attract other bacteria to the slime. And what you're gonna end up with is this complex intermicrobial community that's all living together in slime and that slime is protecting them from antibiotics, from disinfectants, etc. And so they're all living in the slime and they are protected. So if you've ever, you know, gone to bed at night without brushing your teeth and you know how you wake up in the morning and you can feel that slime on your teeth, your teeth feel real slimy, that slime is biofilm forming. And that biofilm is formed by a type of bacteria called Streptococcus mutans, which is in your mouth. And if you don't brush your teeth and that bacteria stays on the teeth, it's gonna produce that slime 
and it's going to lead to a biofilm on the teeth. And when it does that, by the time you can feel it, by the time you can feel that kind of slimy feeling on your teeth, typically the layer of biofilm is about 500 cells deep. So think about that for a minute when you think about your teeth being slimy in the morning. That is about 500 cells deep if you can feel that slime on your teeth. That's pretty nasty. So biofilms, again, intermicrobial communities, and they form these pillar-like structures. And these pillar-like structures give bacteria an advantage that it allows the bacteria to get more oxygen and to get more nutrients. Because you can imagine if this was just one solid layer, right? If this is just one solid layer all across, only the bacteria that's exposed to the outside would get access to oxygen and to nutrients, etc. But by forming these pillar-like structures, we are now increasing the surface area to volume ratio, meaning we have a lot more surface area so that the bacteria are more likely to be able to get oxygen and to be able to get the nutrients that they need. And so by forming these pillar-like structures, it gives bacteria an advantage. Now, these biofilms can form the slime or hydrogels, and then bacteria are attracted by chemicals via something called quorum sensing. Basically, cells that are in the biofilm will send out a chemical signal that will attract other bacteria to the biofilm. This is a type of cell-cell signaling. And so now drugs are being developed to inhibit quorum sensing, to inhibit bacteria from talking to one another, to try and prevent biofilms from forming. Because again, once a biofilm forms, they're much more difficult to get rid of. And so we want to prevent additional bacteria from getting to the biofilm. So where can we find biofilms in the body? One place would be the teeth. So again, like for Streptococcus mutans, it would be found in the teeth and it causes that slime that we feel on our teeth. Mucous membranes. So here is a biofilm that is forming on cilia along the mucous membranes. So biofilms will form along mucous membranes, heart valves, catheters, basically anytime you take something foreign from outside the body and put it in, you run a risk of biofilms forming. And so a catheter, for example, if we talked about a urinary catheter, for example, that is putting a tube up into the bladder for people that can't control their bladder. And so that catheter, that tubing, runs a risk of a biofilm forming. Implants, whether it be breast implants or joint implants, um, organ transplants, basically anything that's coming from the outside in runs a risk of a biofilm. So now let's talk about what advantage do bacteria get by forming a biofilm? What is the advantage to the bacteria by forming a biofilm? So one is it allows bacteria to share nutrients, right? Because again, it's this intermicrobial community living together. They can share nutrients. They can do resource partitioning and divide up resources so that multiple bacteria can survive, etc. It can shelter bacteria from harmful factors in the environment, like desiccation or drying out, right? It helps them to retain water. It helps them to be protected against antibiotics. So again, microbes are about a thousand times more resistant if they're in a biofilm than if they're not. So it gives them a major advantage in being antibiotic resistant. And it also helps protect them against the body's immune system. Because again, if you have this thick layer of slime, it's going to be a lot more difficult to do phagocytosis and to basically grab a hold of all the bacteria that's causing the infection. And so it also helps protect bacteria from the body's immune system. And lastly, it helps with what's called conjugation. And that is the transfer of DNA 
from one bacteria to another. So because bacteria are living in close proximity, it helps facilitate the transfer of DNA from one cell to another. And we will talk about conjugation in a little bit when we talk about pili, which are the structures responsible for conjugation. But bacteria living in a biofilm, those bacteria are going to be more likely to be able to do conjugation because again, they're living in close proximity. So now let's look at some bacteria that have capsules. And so the first one that we can talk about is Streptococcus pneumoniae. You can guess by the name what disease it causes and it causes pneumonia. Next, we have Klebsiella pneumoniae. And Klebsiella pneumoniae is another bacteria that causes pneumonia. It is a gram-negative rod bacteria that is typically gonna be found in the gut. However, if it gets out of the gut and it gets into the lungs, it can cause pneumonia. Or if it gets into the bladder, it causes a urinary tract infection or UTI. And so this is a normal bacteria that's part of normal flora in the gut, but it becomes problematic if it gets out of the gut. Next, we have Haemophilus influenzae. This is a type of bacteria. Notice the name says influenzae, and you might think, well, it causes influenza. It actually doesn't. Influenza is caused by a virus. This is a type of bacteria, and this is going to cause meningitis, which is an inflammation of the meninges, which is part of the nervous system. So it causes meningitis or pneumonia. We have Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This is a common cause of death in burn victims. So in burn victims, if this bacteria happens to get into the wound, it can cause an infection, which can be fatal. Pseudomonas is extremely resistant to not only antibiotics, but also disinfectants as well. And there have been instances of Pseudomonas actually growing in Lysol. So not only is it not effective, but it actually grew within the Lysol, and then when they used it to clean surfaces, it ended up basically just putting Pseudomonas all over a hospital setting. And so Pseudomonas is extremely resistant to antibiotics and disinfectants. So we have Pseudomonas aeruginosa causes the infection and in burn victims. You'll also see later on, we'll talk about Pseudomonas again, when we talk about, um, we'll talk about how it can cause an infection in patients who have cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic condition in which people are born with it and they have defective chloride channels. And as a result of having defective chloride channels, they don't move water properly and they get this thick secretion in their lungs and when that secretion sits there, if bacteria, and specifically Pseudomonas, gets into those secretions and it sits there, it can cause an infection and it can kill these patients who have cystic fibrosis. And so if you've ever seen the movie A Fault in Their Stars, and it's about patients who have cystic fibrosis and patients who have CF are told not to date other people who have CF, and the reason is, is that they're more likely to transmit this infection and then it ends up being fatal to both people because neither one can fight off the infection. Next, we have Neisseria meningitidis. I know that looks like it's probably a typo for meningitis. It's not. The bacterial name is meningitidis and Neisseria gonorrhea. Now again, it's different than gonorrhea spelling. Notice in the middle here, the way I remember this one, it has a hoe in the middle. Gonorrhea is a sexually transmitted infection. So it's a sexually transmitted infection. So if you're a hoe, you could end up with gonorrhea. Now with gonorrhea, that typically had been a sexually transmitted infection that used to be fairly easy to treat. You would take an antibiotic and it would go away. The problem is, is that many strains of Neisseria gonorrhea are now resistant to antibiotics. And there are multi-drug resistant strains, meaning they're resistant to multiple drugs. 
And so those strains of gonorrhea are becoming more and more difficult to treat. And what once was very easy to treat is now becoming a lot more difficult. In the case of Neisseria meningitis, right, that is, um, that's going to cause meningitis, which is an inflammation in the meningitis. It's a type of bacteria that is only hosted by humans, meaning it only infects people. And it's the leading cause of bacterial meningitis in the United States. And it's transmitted through saliva. And if you happen to contract Neisseria meningitis, it can be quite fatal. And in fact, very, very quickly. Uh, there was a girl that went to my high school who contracted it. And she basically, you know, one day went home. She had flu-like symptoms. She wasn't feeling well. She went to bed, woke up the next morning. She had bruises all over her body. Her mom rushed her to the ER, and she died that very next day. So within 24 hours, she had died from this form of meningitis. And so this can be quite fatal. And so at our school, we all got notified, you know, if you shared drinks with her or you had kissed her, that you should go get tested to see if you happen to also carry Neisseria meningitis, meaning you became infected with it, because it can be quite fatal if you contract that form of meningitis. Next, we have Cryptococcus neoformans. This is a yeast. It is a fungus. So instead of being bacterial, this is actually a yeast. And this causes what's called cryptococcosis. And this is basically this organism can be found in bird droppings. And if, for example, if somebody has an immune, um, they are immunocompromised, their immune system is not functioning properly, like is the case for patients who have AIDS, which is late stage HIV. Um, if they happen to have a compromised immune system and they leave their windows open and a bird drop, bird dropping happens, like the bird poops, and it happens to get into your lungs, um, then it can cause inf serious infections for AIDS patients and can be fatal. And so, again, if your immune system is functioning normally, you're not quite as at risk for this. However, if you have some condition that compromises your immune system like AIDS, this could be very fatal. And so these are just some different examples of different organisms that have a capsule. They have this glycocalyx and they can cause disease. So question for you, which of the following statements about the bacterial glycocalyx is false? Red, it may be involved in the formation of biofilms. Yellow, it is used to adhere to surfaces. Green, it makes bacteria non-pathogenic. Blue, it protects from dehydration and nutrient loss. Or purple, it may be composed of polysaccharide. So what I want you to do is to pause your video, think about your answer, and when you're ready, go ahead and push play to hear the answer. So if you said green, you would be correct. So green is the statement that's false. Glycocalyx is involved in the formation of biofilms. That is true. It is used to adhere to surfaces. That's true because it's sticky. Blue, it protects from dehydration and nutrient loss. That is true. Purple, it may be composed of polysaccharide. That is true. It could also be composed of polypeptide, like for bacillus anthracis. That's true. But it does not make bacteria non-pathogenic. Instead, it makes bacteria pathogenic, meaning it makes bacteria able to cause disease. And so green is the statement that is false. So in addition to glycocalyx, some bacteria might have what's called an S layer. And an S layer is a single layer of thousands of copies of a single protein that are linked together like a chain mail. And this is only produced when bacteria are in a hostile environment. And so what you're going to notice is if you look at this diagram here, here is that peptidoglycan, 
then you can see this thin layer of S layer, and then external to that would be the glycocalyx. And so this S layer is only produced when bacteria are in a hostile environment. So next we're gonna move on and we are going to talk about motility structures in bacteria, basically structures that allow bacteria to move. So the main structure used for motility is going to be a flagellum. And in a prokaryotic flagellum, it has three parts. It has a filament, a hook, and a basal body. The filament is the tail-like extension. That's the part that comes out from the cell. It is going to contain the globular protein flagellin, which is arranged in several chains that intertwine and form a helix around a hollow core. When we look at eukaryotic flagellum, you will start to see how they are different than prokaryotic flagellum. Eukaryotic flagellum is made of a protein called tubulin. Prokaryotic flagellum is made of a protein called flagellin. Next, we have the hook. And the hook is basically the part that is going to rotate. It's going to move to help move flagella. Again, one of the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic, in prokaryotic bacteria, the way that the flagellum moves is that the hook rotates in a circular motion. And that causes the tail, the, fl the filament, think of it kind of like a propeller in um, a helicopter, for example. It's going to go in a circular motion. That is very different than eukaryotic flagellum. You will learn later on that eukaryotic flagellum moves in an undulating or wave-like motion. So the way that they move is a little bit different as well. In the case of prokaryotic cells, they have this hook and the hook circles in a circle and it's going to cause the filament to move in a circular motion like a propeller. Then we have the basal body and the basal body is used to anchor the flagellum into the cell wall and the plasma membrane. And the structure of the basal body can be different between gram-negative and gram-positive, and that has to do with the composition of the cell wall. So if you recall when we talked about our gram stain, our outer membrane is in gram-negative, so it has this outer membrane and it has a thin layer of peptidoglycan. In the case of gram-positive, right, gram-positive have a cell membrane they have a thick layer of peptidoglycan, and they have no outer membrane. They just have the one membrane. So as a result, the way that I remember this is that basically there are two rings, two rings within the basal body, the part that anchors the flagellum into the cell envelope. In gram-positive, there are only two rings because there's only one membrane. In the case of gram-negative, we have two membranes, so we have four rings in terms of the basal body. So the way I remember it, it's not necessarily that that's the way it's set up within the cell envelope, but the way that I remember this is that for each membrane that they have, there will be two rings. So gram-positive only have one cell membrane, they will have two rings in terms of their basal body. Gram negative have two membranes. So instead of having two rings, they have four rings to help anchor it into the cell envelope. The cell envelope is referring to the cell membrane and the cell wall together. That whole structure is going to be your cell envelope. And so this is your structure of a prokaryotic flagellum. Now, in terms of the number of flagellum, there are different terms depending on the way that the flagella are arranged. If we say that the cell is atricus, a means without, so no flagellum. This would be a bacteria that does not have flagellum and oftentimes means that they are non-modal. If they have one, we say that they're monotricus. Mono means one at one end. 
So this picture here is an example of a bacterium that is monotrichous. If we say that it's lophotrichous, the way I remember lophotrichous, I think lumped together. There are more than one at just one end. So there's a lump or there's a cluster of multiple flagella at one end. So that's lophotrichous. So multiple flagella at one end. If we say that it's amphitrichous, you're going to see when we talk about the cell membrane, we talk about that a phospholipid is ampopathic. The phospholipid itself um, is going to be amphitrichous, meaning it has a dual nature. It has, you know, the hydrophilic head and it has the hydrophobic tail. So amphi means like both ends. So amphitrichous means that we have flagella coming out of both ends. So we have one here, we have one here. If we say that it is peritrichous, peritrichous means that it's over the entire cell. So there are flagellum just coming off everywhere all over the cell. So E. coli, for example, would be peritrichous. It has lots and lots of flagella on its surface. Now, again, the way in which the bacterium is going to move is going to be different than that of how a eukaryotic cell would move. And so for bacterial flagellum, if they move, if they move their flagellum in a counterclockwise motion, that's going to cause the bacteria to do what we call a run, meaning it's going to move in a directed fashion. If, however, the flagellum starts to rotate the other way and it starts to rotate in a clockwise manner, that is going to cause the bacteria to tumble. And what that means is it's going to change direction. And then it's going to go back and it's going to rotate it counterclockwise and it's going to do a run. And then it's going to go back and turn it the other way. It's going to do a counterclockwise and it's going to do a tumble. And so this is going to continually happen with the bacterium that causes it to move. So if we talk about the way that bacteria move, so if there are no attractants or no repellents, there are no um, stimuli present, bacteria are going to move in a very random fashion. They're going to alternate between runs and tumbles. So the green are the runs, the reds are the tumbles. So notice that this bacteria is not going anywhere in particular. However, if there is some sort of attractant concentration, maybe it's a chemical stimulus like food, and bacteria are trying to move towards that food, notice that you get this net movement towards the attractant. It's not a straight line, it's not gonna be perfect, but bacteria will start to move towards the, that signal. And so if your stimulus is a chemical stimulus, we call that chemotaxis. Chemo refers to chemical. That is movement in response to a chemical. Now, when we talk about movement in response to a chemical, we can talk about positive chemotaxis and negative chemotaxis. Positive means motility towards a stimulus. So like food, for example, bacteria would display positive chemotaxis towards that food source. It's going to move towards that food. If we say that it's negative chemotaxis, that is motility away from the stimulus, meaning the bacteria wants to go away from it. It could be a toxin, it could be a waste product, et cetera, but bacteria wanna move away from that stimulus. Now, stimuli could also not just be chemical, but it could be light. Phototaxis, photo refers to light, that is movement in response to light. So like a plant, for example, would display positive phototaxis. It's gonna to grow towards sunlight because they need sunlight to do photosynthesis. So that would be positive phototaxis. Now, 
if we talk about the way in which bacteria move. They move again using flagella. Flagellar proteins are what are called H antigens. And H antigens are useful to determine strains of a bacteria. What is an antigen? Well, an antigen is any substance that elicits an immune response, meaning it's something that the immune system recognizes as foreign. So if we look at these H antigens, these different types of antigens that can be present on the flagella, if we look at those H antigens, we can, in some cases, determine the strain of bacteria that we're looking at. For example, everybody has E. coli in your gut. It's part of your normal flora. That E. coli that's in your gut isn't going to cause disease. However, you've probably heard of E. coli causing food poisoning. If you think of Chipotle, for example, they've had outbreaks of E. coli. It's not the standard E. coli that's found in your gut. It's a particular strain of E. coli, and that strain of E. coli is called O157H7. So it has this O antigen, which you're going to learn later is part of its LPS, so part of its outer membrane. It has that type of antigen, and it also has this H7 or flagellar antigen, this special molecule that's found on the flagella. And so that particular strain of E. coli is identified by these two antigens, this O antigen and this H antigen, and this strain of E. coli is the one that's going to make you sick. And that's because that strain of E. coli has acquired the gene for what's called a Shiga toxin. And Shigella is a type of bacteria that produces this Shiga toxin, and it causes patients to have severe diarrheal disease, an upset stomach, etc. Now, E. coli at some point hooked up with Shigella, and Shigella passed the gene for the Shiga toxin to E. coli. E. coli now has this gene, it has this DNA sequence, and it now produces that Shiga toxin protein. And that strain of E. coli is the one that's going to cause you to get food poisoning. It's not your standard E. coli because the standard E. coli are not going to produce that toxin. But this E. coli 0157H7 is going to produce this toxin, and therefore, when you consume this one, that is going to give you food poisoning. And so the H antigen is just this type of foreign molecule on the flagella that help us to identify this particular strain of E. coli. Now, we can also talk about flagella being attached to the outside of the cell. And if it's attached to the outside of the cell, it's referred to as an endoflagella, endo meaning within, it's attached to the outside of the cell. That's also referred to, referred to as an axial filament. An axial filament is, is a flagella that is anchored at one end, and then it wraps around the length of the bacterium. This type of structure is found in spirochetes, right? Remember that spirochetes are, are flexible spirals. And when we talked about our negative stain and we talked about using a negative stain to look for spirochetes, right? You can think of several diseases that were caused by spirochetes, one of which being treponema pallidum causes syphilis. And treponema pallidum remember, is a sexually transmitted infection. It's going to be passed from person to person through sexual contact. And so if somebody is infected and they have this canker, the sore, and you happen to come in contact with that, and it passes from the genitals of one person who has it to somebody else that they're having a sexual contact with, this axial filament is going to help the spirochete to move like a corkscrew. So it's going to work just like a corkscrew would if you're trying to open a bottle of wine. It's going to screw its way through. So if you screw, you get screwed. 
Very funny, right? Sexually transmitted infection. So it's going to screw its way through the skin. It's going to penetrate. It's going to cause a canker at the site of where the bacteria has gone in. And it's then going to lead to syphilis in the person who made contact. Another example of this, the one that's shown here, um, leptospira. Leptospira is found in infected animal urine, like cats and dogs, etc. And if, let's say, a cat urinates in a lake, you can end up with something called leptospirosis, where you can get an unexplained fever and you get really sick if left untreated. And so this would just be another example of an organism that would have an axial filament. It's actually the flagella in this case is wrapped around the length of the spirochete. It's not free like a typical flagellum would be. So next we have our fimbriae. Fimbriae are these fine proteinaceous, meaning protein containing, hair-like bristles from the surface of the cell. And these structures are shorter, meaning they're not as long. They are more straight and they are thinner than flagella. And their purpose is different than flagella. Flagella is used for motility, for movement. Fimbriae is not. Fimbriae is used for attachment. So it allows tight adhesion between fimbriae and epithelial cells. And this allows bacteria to colonize and infect host tissues. So what you're looking at down here, this is intestinal microvilli, these little projections along the intestines. And E. coli is a type of bacteria that produces fimbriae. And these structures, these protein structures, allow it to attach and adhere to the intestinal microvilli. It allows it to attach to the intestinal wall. And it allows E. coli to live and colonize the gut. And so fimbriae is a structure. Again, not all bacteria have them. But those that do have them, that structure is used for attachment. It allows bacteria to adhere to a surface. Next, we have pili, or pilus would be singular. This is a rigid tubular structure made of this pilin protein. And this is found in gram-negative cells. So this is going to be found in gram-negative cells exclusively. And it has several purposes. It has several uses. So one main thing that pili do is that they're used to transfer genetic material through what's called conjugation. And that is that one cell is going to produce these pili and it's going to send out these extensions to another cell and they're going to hook up and the one that sent this projection, the one that produced the pili, can then transfer genes to this recipient. And those genes could be genes for antibiotic resistance. So that's how bacteria can acquire antibiotic resistance. It could pass genes for the production of a capsule, for bacteria to produce fimbriae, for bacteria to produce pili, to produce toxins, etc. Basically, it's a way for bacteria to hook up and exchange genetic information. One bacteria is going to give genes, give DNA sequences to a recipient. That is referred to as conjugation. It can also act like fimbriae and assist in attachment. And it can act like flagella and also help to make bacteria modal. It does this gliding and twitching motion instead. So pili actually do a lot of different things. They have a lot of purposes within the cell. But the one that we think of most commonly is conjugation. So allowing bacteria to hook up and to exchange genetic information. And you'll see a lot more about this in our genetics chapter. So question for you. Which of the following is not part of a flagellum? 
red filament, yellow hook, green fimbriae, blue basal body. So I want you to think about your answer, pause your video, and when you're ready, push play to hear the answer. If you said green fimbriae, you are correct. The fimbriae is not part of the flagellum. It's a totally separate structure, right? It's used for attachment. It is shorter. It's thinner. It's more rigid. It's not like a bacterium flagellum. So the filament, again, is the part that's coming off for the flagellum. It's the tail-like extension. The hook is the part that rotates. And the basal body is the part of the flagellum that anchors it into the cell envelope. So the fimbriae is not part of the flagellum. So now we're going to move to structures inside the cell wall of prokaryotes. So if we move inside, we have the cytoplasm. This is the substance inside the plasma membrane. And it's approximately 80% water plus proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, ions, etc. And the purpose of the cytoplasm is that it serves as a pool for building blocks for cell synthesis or for sources of energy. So basically for cells to make different structures within the cell, serves as a pool to make, you know, macromolecules when the cell needs to divide, etc. And so that fluid inside the cell membrane is the cytoplasm. And within the cytoplasm, it has this semi-fluid substance that we call cytosol. Now, bacteria have a nucleoid region. Nucleoid region. So it's not a nucleus. It is not surrounded by a membrane. But it's just this region within the cell where the DNA is found. And if we look at types of DNA sequences that would be found in the nucleoid region, we can have bacterial chromosomes. And the bacterial chromosomes, again, are typically one circular double-stranded chromosome or DNA. Now, again, some bacteria might have more than one, but typically most bacterial chromosomes are one circular double-stranded DNA. And the bacterial chromosome is going to carry, so you should put this as a note here, it's going to carry essential genes, meaning that piece of DNA makes proteins that are absolutely necessary for the cell. So when we talk about metabolism, for example, and we talk about bacteria doing glycolysis, an enzyme in glycolysis is going to be essential. Bacteria need it to carry out that process. That gene would be on a bacterial chromosome. That is an essential gene. Plasmids, on the other hand, are small extra chromosomal genetic elements, meaning that they're not part of the host chromosome. They are separate circular DNAs. And the purpose of the plasmid is that it's going to carry non-crucial genes. Basically, it's going to carry DNA sequences that give bacteria an advantage, but aren't necessarily necessary. So a gene for antibiotic resistance might be found on a plasmid because bacteria don't necessarily require it, but it is helpful if they have it. Production of a toxin, for example, would be on a plasmid. And so the difference between a plasmid and a chromosome, again, not only are they, you know, essential genes for the chromosome and non-essential genes for plasmids, but the other big thing is, is that bacteria will only replicate their chromosome when they are going to divide. Plasmids are separate. They can replicate independently of cell division. So they have some autonomy in terms of the way that they replicate. And so different plasmids have different what we call copy numbers, 
or basically how fast they replicate and they produce copies of themselves. So a plasmid is going to be extra chromosomal and it gives bacterial advantage and it replicates on its own. So now we're going to look at the prokaryotic ribosome. And the prokaryotic ribosome, remember that all cells have ribosomes. Prokaryotic ribosomes are used for protein synthesis. So again, it's how the cell is going to synthesize or produce proteins. The ribosome is made of ribosomal RNA and proteins. So it's a mixture. It's proteins and ribosomal RNA. And ribosomal RNA is basically just a type of RNA. And in the case of the ribosome, the ribosomal RNA plays a role in formation of peptide bonds, meaning it plays a role in the formation of the protein. It helps with the synthesis and the catalyst to form a protein. And so this is not a membrane-bound organelle. It's not made of a membrane. It's simply a collection of ribosomal RNA and proteins. And so this is why prokaryotic cells have it, right? Because prokaryotic cells don't have membrane-bound organelles, but they do have a ribosome. It's not a membrane-bound structure. Now, prokaryotic ribosomes, there are two subunits. There is what is called the small subunit, so here's your small subunit. And in prokaryotic cells, the small subunit is what we call 30S. The S just refers to this Svedberg unit. It basically has to do with um, how it centrifuges. Like if you put it in a tube and you put it in a sucrose gradient, how fast that ribosomal subunit is going to move through a tube as it's being centrifuged, which means to spin it really fast. And so basically the small subunit is made of what we call a 30S. The large subunit is what we call a 50S. However, collectively, when you put the two subunits together, they actually make a 70S ribosome. It's not necessarily additive. So the two subunits together will measure at 70S, and we call these 70S ribosomes. This is going to be different for eukaryotic ribosomes. Eukaryotic ribosomes, the small subunit is going to be 40S. So in a eukaryotic cell, it's going to be 40S. In a eukaryotic cell, the large is going to be a 60S, so a 40 and a 60 and combined, they weigh 80S. So I know that's a little bit tricky. You're just gonna have to study those numbers to just know it's a 30S and a 50S, and combined, it gives you a 70S. When we look at eukaryotic ribosomes, it's gonna be different. It's a 60S and a 40S, and combined, they are 80S. So next we have our inclusions, and our inclusions are these intracellular storage bodies that serve as temporary reserve deposits. Basically, it's where the cell is going to store something. So if we look at metachromatic granules or volutin, this is basically a place for phosphate reserves. The cell uses phosphates to make ATP, so adenosine triphosphate, which is energy. It's used to make phospholipids, and it's used to make nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. And so this is basically where bacteria can store their phosphate reserves. Bacteria can have polysaccharide granules. Their function is energy reserves. You can imagine what those study, those store. Those store polysaccharides, those store sugars. We can have lipid inclusions. Again, those are energy reserves because lipids are rich in energy. We have sulfur granules. Those also serve as energy reserves. We have carboxysomes. Those basically will store an enzyme called Rubisco. And this Rubisco enzyme is used in 
uh, carbon dioxide fixation during photosynthesis. So basically it's gonna take, it's gonna play a role in photosynthesis. So cyanobacteria, for example, would have these carboxysomes to store that Rubisco enzyme, which allows them to do photosynthesis. Bacteria may have what are called gas vacuoles. These are basically protein covered cylinders that maintain buoyancy, meaning it helps bacteria to float. Now think about why certain bacteria might want to float. And the answer is, again, cyanobacteria, which does photosynthesis, is aquatic. If that bacteria were to sink to the bottom, is it going to get access to sunlight? And the answer is no, it's not gonna have access to sunlight and therefore is not gonna be able to do photosynthesis. However, if they have gas in these vacuoles and they float, right, if they go to the surface, they're gonna get access to the sunlight and they're gonna be able to do photosynthesis. And so these gas vacuoles basically help bacteria float. Bacteria can have magnetosomes, and these are basically these iron oxide inclusions, and they're used to help destroy hydrogen peroxide, which can be toxic to the cell. And so this is just showing you an electron micrograph of these magnetosomes. They are artificially colored pink, and so you can see these little inclusions within the cell, and they are basically going to act as these inclusions. And so lastly, we're gonna look at an endospore, and an endospore is found mostly in gram-positive. So again, not exclusively, but mostly gram-positive. And there are two main genera that produce endospores and that is Clostridium and Bacillus. Clostridium is going to be our anaerobic, meaning it grows in the absence of oxygen. Bacillus is aerobic, it grows in the presence of oxygen. So endospores are basically a structure that are used for survival. They're used to survive adverse environments. So when conditions become unfavorable. You can think of an endospore just like in the endospore stain when I talk about this. You can think of an endospore as a structure that bacteria can produce that basically allow them to go into hibernation. It's when they experience their conditions as being harsh. What are some harsh conditions? Dehydration, so not having enough water, lack of nutrients, radiation like UV, for example, um, heat, freezing, chemicals, etc. Lack of O2 in some cases, or presence of O2 in some cases. But basically, when the bacteria experience their environment as harsh, they will package their DNA into this keratin structure. This endospore is made of keratin, and so it's this tough structural protein and it's going to form around the DNA, and it's gonna protect that DNA. So as the bacteria form their endospore, that process for the formation of the endospore is referred to as sporulation. So that's the process of forming the endospore. When conditions become favorable again, it's gonna go back to being a vegetative state, and that process going from a spore to a vegetative state again, that process is referred to as germination. Think of a plant can germinate when the seed sprouts. That's germination. It's like it's coming out. Same idea in the case of the endospores. It's like the endospore is coming out. It's going back to a metabolically active state. It's no longer going to be in hibernation. Now, in terms of the endospores, their longevity verges on immortality. So anywhere from 25 to 250 million years. So these endospores have been found to have been millions of years old, and they're able to basically go back to being vegetative cells.
So you can almost think of it kind of like zombie bacteria. They're bacteria that basically can shut themselves down. They can go into hibernation. And then when conditions become favorable, then they can go back to being metabolically active and reproducing. And so this is just showing you an endospore in Bacillus anthracis. So it's starting to form this structure within the cell. And it's basically going to wait it out until conditions become favorable. So again, this is a similar drawing that was seen in your lab for the endospore. And so again, we have our vegetative cell. This cell is metabolically active. When conditions become harsh, they're going to undergo sporulation. They're going to package up their DNA and they're going to put it in this endospore structure, which is made of keratin. And that endospore can be terminal, meaning off to one end. It could be centrally located in the middle. It could be subterminal, which means not all the way to the end, but off to one side. And so while that spore is still within the cell, it's referred to as an endospore. And the endospore is within the vegetative mother cell. Now, if this cell still is experiencing their condition as being harsh, eventually this vegetative mother cell is going to break down and you're going to be left with a spore. Now, this is not to be confused with a spore like for fungi, for example. In fungi, when we talk about spores or in plants, when we talk about spores, those are structures that are used for reproduction, meaning that's how the cell is going to reproduce. In bacteria, spores are not for reproduction. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's when the cell is not dividing. So be careful. A spore in bacteria is not a reproductive structure. It's the opposite. It's when it's dormant. It's when it's not metabolically active and it's not dividing. However, when conditions become favorable, bacteria can germinate and they can go back to being a metabolically active vegetative cell. So it usually takes about six to 10 hours for sporulation to occur. This will take several steps. Germination typically only takes about one and a half hours, and that's how quickly it can go back to being metabolically active. And so this is how endospores are formed. Again, not all bacteria will have this structure, this is typically gram-positive and most commonly in bacillus and clostridium. So this is just showing you some examples of endospore-producing bacteria and the diseases that they cause. So the first one is bacillus anthracis. This bacteria is found in soil as well as infected animals. Um, cows, for example can transmit bacillus anthracis, etc. This, if it's bacillus, it is aerobic, right? So it's going to grow in the presence of oxygen and it causes the disease anthrax. It could be cutaneous, which is on the skin. It could be in the lungs. But think about the lungs and the skin. Those are both environments where oxygen is readily available. So that's how one of the ways you can know that bacillus anthracis must be aerobic because it grows where oxygen is present. Next, we have Clostridium botulinum. Clostridium botulinum can be found in soil and canned foods. And this bacteria is anaerobic, grows in the absence of oxygen, and the disease that it causes is botulism. Botulism can, be, can happen in infants. One of the ways that infants can contract botula, uh, botulism is through consumption of honey. This is why infants are, or parents are told don't feed infants um, honey until they're over a year because before a year their immune system is not able to fight it off and they could get botulism, which leads to this floppy baby syndrome where their muscle tone is just really low. Um, and they don't, um, they're not able to have like their muscles contract properly. 
Uh, botulism is also associated with canned foods. If you've ever like heard people say, you know, don't eat from a can that's severely dented, especially if it's along the seam of the can. And the reason for that is that if the can gets dented and it gets these little microscopic um, holes in the can and this bacteria gets in, it can also cause this botulism. Clostridium botulinum produces this botulinum toxin, which is one of the most powerful neurotoxins known to mankind. And this toxin basically causes muscles to not contract. It causes muscles to be relaxed. And so in this case, botulinum toxin is used in Botox. So if you've ever heard of Botox, right, Botox is an injection and it's where they inject this botulinum toxin into basically the nerves, the muscles, and they basically get the muscles to relax so it basically softens the wrinkles. And so when you think of Botox, that's probably, you know, the most common use you think of Botox is for you know, wrinkles. However, Botox does have a lot of other uses that are actually very important. They can be used in, uh, it can be used for urinary incontinence. So people who have like an overactive bladder, um, botulinum toxin can be injected to help relax the bladder so it's not spastic anymore and it's not causing the overactive bladder. Uh, bot Botox can be used for migraines, for example. There are actually many other uses for Botox other than, you know, wrinkles. It does have other uses as well. And so this is actually produced by Allergan, which has now been bought by another company. But Allergan is a company that is in Irvine. It's local. And that is where Botox is produced. So that's Clostridium botulinum. Clostridium perfringens. Clostridium perfringens is found in soil and in deep wounds. It's an anaerobic bacteria and it causes gas gangrene. Basically, it causes the tissue to become necrotic and it starts to rot. And as the tissue starts to become necrotic and as it starts to rot and there's not blood flow, well now that is an anaerobic environment and clostridium perfringens can grow. And so one of the things that, or one of the problems is that when bacteria are in endospores, they're very, um, they're very resistant to antibiotics. And so one of the things that can be done for gangrene is that um, medical maggots can be put on the tissue and those maggots can consume the endospores and try to get them out of the tissue. But if not possible, oftentimes what has to happen is going to be amputation. Because once that tissue is necrotic and it's dead, oftentimes it needs to be removed. We have Clostridium tetani, which is found in soil as well as deep wounds. It is anaerobic and it's going to cause tetanus. Tetanus, you can think of kind of like the opposite of botulism. Botulism is where the muscle tone um, is going to be very relaxed, and that's when it leads to that floppy baby syndrome. Tetanus is the opposite. It causes the muscles to contract, and they get stuck in this contract form, and the patients get, you know, a lockjaw, they get these muscle contortions where their body is like frozen in this crazy contortion because of this uh, tetanus toxin. And so that is produced by Clostridium tetani. And then lastly, we have Clostridium difficile, what you'll often hear referred to as C. diff. And C. diff is transmitted through feces and through infected patients. It is one of the top five killers of hospital-acquired infections, meaning you go into the hospital for something else and you leave with a C. diff infection because it's highly contagious and it's really difficult to treat.
it is a bacteria that is anaerobic and it causes colitis. Basically, it's going to cause this inflammation in the colon and it's going to basically give the patient uncontrollable diarrhea. And so the patient just gets really sick with this just really awful diarrheal disease. And basically when this patient has diarrhea, millions or billions of endospores are being released. And then a healthcare worker can take those endospores or that disease to other patients. And that's how you end up with this hospital acquired infection because they produce lots and lots of these endospores in the feces of people who have C. diff. And so one of the ways that they now try and treat C. diff, because C. diff is not well managed often with antibiotics, it's really difficult to get rid of it. So one of the things that they sometimes will do is what's called a fecal transplant. And what they will do is they'll take fecal matter from somebody else and they will transplant it into somebody who has a C. diff infection. Oftentimes, it would be somebody that you live with, that you have a lot of contact with, because that person would be likely to have a lot of the same normal flora bacteria in their gut. <coughs> and so when they do a fecal transplant, the goal is basically by putting that fecal matter back into the intestines, so put somebody else's fecal matter into the intestines, the idea is to put good bacteria back into the gut so that it can outcompete the C. diff. And so there has been some success with this approach by basically putting back in good bacteria to outcompete the bad bacteria, to outcompete the C. diff for the infection in the intestine. And so this is just kind of a list of some examples of endospore producing bacteria and the disease that they cause. So question for you. What structure protects pathogenic bacteria from phagocytosis? Is it red capsule, yellow endospore, green flagellum, blue axial filament, or purple ribosomes? So take a minute, pause your video, think about your answer, and when you're ready, push play to hear the answer. So if you said capsule, you are correct. The capsule is a structure that is used to protect against phagocytosis. It's going to protect from the immune system from being able to engulf that bacteria. The endospore is not going to protect against phagocytosis. Basically, an endospore is a structure that bacteria produce in response to a harsh condition. Um, it's not necessarily going to protect against phagocytosis. <coughs> Flagellum green is not correct. That is a structure used for motility. Axial filaments is also a structure used for motility. Again, that's an endofilament. It's what's used for motility for spirochetes. Ribosomes are not going to be used to protect from phagocytosis. The ribosome's job is to basically synthesize protein. So the capsule is the structure that's going to protect against phagocytosis. And so the next part is going to be looking at bacterial cell walls. The cell wall is going to be just outside the cell membrane. And the function of the cell wall is to prevent what's called osmotic lysis, meaning that to prevent if water goes into the bacterial cell, to prevent the bacteria from lysing or breaking open. And so we'll get to that topic in just another minute. The other function of the cell wall is that it's there to help protect the cell membrane. And remember that when we looked at bacteria, most bacterial cell walls are made primarily of peptidoglycan. Again, peptido refers to protein, glycan refers to sugar. And so you're going to see when we look at the peptidoglycan that it's a mixture of these sugars and these proteins put together. And so the cell wall often contributes to the pathogenicity, which is basically the ability for the bacteria to cause disease.
And so if we look at peptidoglycan, peptidoglycan is a polymer of a disaccharide. So meaning that it's this disaccharide, di means two sugars put, put together, and they're going to be repeating over and over again in the peptidoglycan. And if we look at the peptidoglycan, the disaccharide is made of what's called NAG and NAM. And so this is the sugar for NAG. This is the sugar for NAM. And so I'm not going to ask you what NAG and NAM stand for, okay? But if you wanted to look at it, it's N-acetylglucosamine, and then NAM would be the N-acetylmuramic acid. And so when we look at these peptidoglycan, the disaccharide that's used is NAG and NAM bound together. So now elaborating on the fact that the peptidoglycan is NAG and NAM, in addition, we need to look at the overall structure. And so when we look at this, notice we have alternating NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM. And so we get these rows or these backbones of carbohydrates. This backbone of carbohydrates, um, those are going to be typically about 10 to 65 sugars long for the carbohydrate backbone and running perpendicular to those carbohydrate backbones are the protein part of this. And so again, remember that when we look at peptidoglycan, peptido refers to protein, glycan is gonna be the sugar. And so when we look at the amino acids that are used, they have these peptide cross bridges. And so what you'll see is you'll see that it's these amino acids and these amino acids link the peptidoglycan, the sugars together. And so the amino acids, attach to the NAM. So amino acids attach to NAM. And those amino acids are alternating D and L amino acids. And so remember that in nature, most amino acids exist in nature as L amino acids. But in this case, we're actually looking at the isomers and they're gonna alternate between the D and the L form of those amino acids. And so again, our rows of carbohydrates are linked together by polypeptides. So now we're gonna compare and contrast gram-positive and gram-negative bacterial cell walls. And so if you remember back to lab, where we looked at the cell walls for the gram stain, gram-positives, remember, have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan. And in that peptidoglycan, there's what's called tachoic acids. And these tachoic acids are going to consist of an alcohol and a phosphate. And the tachoic acids are negatively charged. And what that's used for is it helps to bind and regulate the movement of cations, meaning positively charged ions, into and out of the cell. And when we look at tachoic acids, there are two main categories. There are the lipotachoic acids. Lipo refers to lipids. And if you look, here are the lipotachoic acids, and those actually help to link the cell wall into the cell membrane, meaning that these types of tachoic acid can actually embed themselves in the lipid in the cell membrane. There are also what are called wall tachoic acids. And so if you look, here are the wall tachoic acids. And notice that they're not embedded in the cell membrane. Instead, the wall tachoic acids are used to link those uh, peptidoglycan layers together. In addition, the 
Um, tachoic acids can be antigenic. And remember that when we looked at flagella, for example, flagella have an H antigen, which can be useful in identifying the bacteria. Same thing for the tachoic acids is that these have these antigens, which are these molecules that can be regulated or identified by the immune system. And using those antigens on the tachoic acid, it can help us to identify the bacteria in certain lab tests. So when we look at gram-negative bacteria, remember that for gram-negative bacteria, it has a very thin layer of peptidoglycan, but it has an outer membrane. And so when we look at the structure of the gram-negative cell walls, they don't have tachoic acids. And so they lack the tachoic acids because they have a thin layer of peptidoglycan. The space that's in between the two membranes, that's called the periplasmic space. And so the periplasmic space is going to be between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. And in the case of gram negatives, it has the peptidoglycan. When we look at the outer membrane of the um, gram negative organisms, the outer membrane has three parts. And these three parts collectively are called LPS or lipopolysaccharides. And so when we look at these, the LPS has an O polysaccharide, a core polysaccharide, and lipid A. And so in a minute, we'll talk more about what these LPS are used for. In addition, they also have phospholipids. So again, they're those phospholipid bilayer. And they have these lipoproteins, which help to hold the outer membrane to the periplasmic space. And again, one of the things that's going to be different from gram positive versus gram negative is that for gram negative cell walls, no tachoic acid. So they have an outer membrane, they have thin peptidoglycan, and they don't use tachoic acids in their cell wall. So if we look at the outer membrane of gram negative bacteria, this has several functions. One is that this outer membrane helps to protect from phagocytosis. Remember that means that that is when the white blood cells engulf the bacteria and take them in and destroy them. And so this membrane makes it harder for the immune system to do phagocytosis, which then also then means it's harder for the body to eliminate that bacteria. It also helps to protect gram-negative organisms from something called complement. And complement you're gonna learn about when we talk about immunology, but these are basically blood defense proteins, proteins that the immune system produces in response to some type of infection. And so this, the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria helps to prevent against complement, meaning again, it helps it to survive. In addition, outer membrane is also used to um, protect the bacteria from antibiotics. And one of the ways through which they can do that is embedded in this membrane are these porins. And these porins are these channels through the membrane. And these proteins, these porins, are selectively permeable. And so what that means is that these porins can regulate what goes into and out of the cell. And so as a result, sometimes the porins get mutations through which antibiotics no longer can get into the gram-negative cell. And so having this outer membrane helps gram-negative bacteria to be typically more resistant to antibiotics. The outer membrane is also protective against digestive enzymes, detergents, etc. And so you're going to see that this is really important when we talk about why gram negative organisms are so important. So if we look now at more detail of the outer cell membrane, we're going to focus more now on looking at in the outer membrane. 
So again, here's our outer membrane. Notice here's our per periplasmic space. Again, it's the space between the cell membrane and the outer membrane. We have our thin layer of peptidoglycan. We have those lipoproteins that link the peptidoglycan into those membranes. And then now we're gonna focus on talking about the lipopolysaccharides, the LPS. And so if we look at a bigger diagram of the LPS, again, the parts of the LPS is gonna be what's called an O polysaccharide. And so if we look, this is an LPS blown up. Here is the O polysaccharide. And the O polysaccharide at the top, so this would be up here, the O polysaccharide. The O polysaccharide is the antigen. Again, it's what allows to um, recognize and to determine a particular type of bacteria, meaning it's useful for distinguishing between different species. And so remember when I talked about E. coli, E. coli is a type of bacteria found in your gut. And remember we said that normal strains of E. coli don't cause food poisoning. The strains of E. coli that typically are responsible for food poisoning is the E. coli O157H7. And we said H7, that's for the flagellar antigen. The O157 is for the antigen that's found on the LPS in the outer membrane. And again, these antigens are useful for identifying a particular type of bacteria. We also have this core polysaccharide. So again, poly meaning many sugars. So these are these sugars linked together. And the core polysaccharide is there to provide stability. It's there for structural purposes. And then lastly, we have our lipid A. And the lipid A helps the LPS to embed in the cell membrane. And lipid A also has what's called an endotoxin. And an endotoxin is basically going to be a toxin that the bacteria produce. And when they produce this endo endotoxin, it causes fever, blood vessel damage, Um, blood pressure goes down. So you start to lose blood out of the leaky blood vessels. Um, that can lead to inappropriate blood clotting, heart rate goes up, and then shock. And if left untreated, this can prove to be fatal. And so for the gram-negative organisms, remember that we said that one of the main reasons that a physician would order a gram stain is because determining the gram reaction of the infection is extremely important. Remember we said that that's for two reasons. One being that if you look at um, the differences between gram positives and gram negatives, some antibiotics like penicillin, for example, penicillin inhibits peptidoglycan. Gram positives have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. Gram negatives have a thin layer. So penicillin is specific towards gram positive organisms. So if your patient had a gram negative infection, giving them penicillin won't be useful to treat that infection. But the other important reason about knowing the gram reaction is remember that I mentioned that if, you, if your patient has a gram negative infection, you don't want to prescribe an antibiotic that's going to cause the bacterial cells to rupture. That's called uh, bacteriocidal. Cidal means kill. You don't want to prescribe a drug that's going to kill the gram-negative organism, 
which would rupture the cell and it would release all that lipid A, which could lead to shock. So if your patient had a gram negative infection, you would instead want to prescribe a drug that is what we call bacteriostatic. Static means stays the same. And for bacteriostatic antibiotics, those antibiotics simply inhibit the bacteria from growing and they give the immune system time to catch up. And so again, knowing the type of infection that a patient has can be really important for trying to decide what antibiotic to prescribe to that patient. So this slide is just comparing gram positives and gram negatives. So again, gram positives have a thick peptidoglycan. Again, it's about eight times thicker typically than um, gram negatives. Gram positives have the tachoic acids in their cell wall. Gram negatives have a thin peptidoglycan. They lack tachoic acids. They have an outer membrane. So again, if we look at this outer membrane, right, we have our cell membrane, we have the outer membrane, and we have this periplasmic space, the space that exists between the outer membrane and the cell membrane. And so this is looking at comparing gram positives and gram negatives. And so in your question set, there's um, a question about to diagram what the cell walls look like for gram positive versus gram negative. And so these examples down here would be like what you'd wanna draw. So you would draw gram positives have a thick peptidoglycan. They have the lipotachoic acids. Again, those are the ones that link the peptidoglycan to the cell membrane. They have wall tachoic acids, which help to hold them together, but they don't go into um, the cell membrane of the gram negative organism. Again, when we look at gram positives, you would want the cell membrane, you would want the periplasmic space, you would want a label, a thin layer of peptidoglycan, periplasmic space again, and then the outer membrane. And so when we look at the outer membrane, it has those porins or the channels, which regulate what goes into and out for a gram negative organism. And it has those lipopolysaccharides, the LPS, and those have those three parts. The O polysaccharide being at the top, the core polysaccharide being here, and then the lipid A is the part that's embedded in the membrane. So this is just another diagram showing you again, comparing gram positives and gram negatives. And so these are an elect electron micrograph and these have been artificially colored. So these colors that you're seeing on this image don't actually exist when these pictures were taken. But what these are, what these are doing is that the yellow is where they've labeled the cell membrane. And so remember that all cells have a cell membrane. So in this case, here's our cell membrane, here's our cell membrane for our gram positives and our gram negatives. If we look at the peptidoglycan, the peptidoglycan has been colored um, brown. Notice that the peptidoglycan is much thicker in the gram positives than it is in the gram negatives. And again, gram positives have a much thicker peptidoglycan when compared to gram negatives. However, gram negatives have this additional outer membrane and notice that it's lacking for the gram positives. The other thing to point out is that notice that when we look over here, notice you see this area that's in between the peptidoglycan and the outer membrane, that's the periplasmic space. And over here, that's the periplasmic space. It's the space between the peptidoglycan and the membrane. Over here, notice there seems to be a little gap here, but it's typically not thought of as gram positives having a periplasmic space that perhaps this little gap that you're seeing there is simply due to an artifact that occurred during this procedure. Um, and so typically when we think of gram positives and gram negatives, gram negatives have that periplasmic space because they have the cell membrane and the outer membrane. Gram positives on the other hand have the cell membrane and then they have 
the thick layer of peptidoglycan. So remember in lab, we talked about the gram stain. And the gram stain, remember, is a differential stain, which allows us to um, differentiate bacteria based on their differences in their peptidoglycan. And so remember, we're going to look at this again, but gram stain has the four steps. And in the first step, we use the crystal violet. And the crystal violet, and so let's go ahead and put the pen back on. And so for gram negative, or I'm sorry, for gram positive bacteria, gram positive bacteria, because they have the thick peptidoglycan, they're going to retain the crystal violet and they're going to stain purple. So here, these are our gram positive bacteria. For gram negative bacteria, because they have a thin peptidoglycan, when we go to decolorize, the decolorizer is going to shrink that very small layer of peptidoglycan, and the dye, the, the, the crystal violet, is going to come out of the gram negative cells. And so we're going to say gram negative cells lose crystal violet and they stain pink because of saffronin. And saffronin is going to be our counter stain. And so we're going to walk through again the steps in the gram stain. So when we look at the four steps of the gram stain procedure, remember that the first step is going to be the crystal violet step. And the crystal violet is our primary stain. And crystal violet is going to be a basic stain. Which remember means that the stain is positively charged and it's attracted to the negatively charged cell. And so remember that when we look at gram positives and gram negatives, the positive and negatives have nothing to do with the charge of the bacteria. In both cases, these bacteria are negatively charged. The only difference between gram positives and gram negatives is again, the thickness of the peptidoglycan. And so gram positives and gram negatives are both negatively charged cells. And so we use a basic stain, which has a positive charge, and that basic stain, that crystal violet, is going to be used to stain both gram positives and gram negatives. And so notice at this point in the staining procedure, both are going to be purple. Then we add the iodine, and the iodine, remember, is our mordant. And what this does is it creates a crystal violet iodine complex. And what that does is it makes those crystal violet molecules larger to basically help to keep the crystal violet into the cells. At this point, both gram positives and gram negatives are both purple. Then we add our decolorizer and our decolorizer is going to be our alcohol acetone. And remember that this is the most important step in the entire procedure. And that's because this is where we get our differential stain. If we time this just right, what happens is, is as we run the decolorizer over the cells or over the slide, gram positives have that thick peptidoglycan. Gram negatives have the outer membrane and a thin peptidoglycan. And so as we add the decolorizer, because this membrane is lipids, it's going to dissolve. And because it has a thin peptidoglycan, that peptidoglycan is going to shrink. And because it's so much thinner, the dye molecules are going to go out of the gram negative and leave the cell. If we do this properly, gram positive cells are going to retain the crystal violet. And that's because they have a much thicker layer of peptidoglycan. So again, you have to time that just right in order for gram negative to be clear 
and gram positives to be purple. Then after we do the decolorizer step, then we're gonna use our safranin. And safranin is our secondary stain or our counter stain. And remember that that step is important because that allows us to stain the now colorless gram negative bacteria. In terms of gram positives, remember that when we add safranin, safranin is also a basic stain. meaning that it is attracted to the negatively charged cell. So for gram positives, the safranin still gets in, but the purple dye, which is the crystal violet, is darker and those cells appear purple. When we look at the gram negative bacteria, which lost the crystal violet because of their thinner peptidoglycan, when we now add the safranin or our counter stain, now the red dye stains the colorless cells and it allows us to be able to see the gram-negative cells. And so notice that when the staining procedure is done, gram-positive cells are gonna be purple, gram-negative cells are gonna be reddish pink. And so this again is a differential stain. It allows us to differentiate between closely related bacteria. So we just finished looking at gram staining. And remember that we said that for gram-positive gram or gram-negative bacteria, that most bacteria fall into one of those two categories. About 95% of bacteria are considered to be either gram positive or to be gram negative. Now, there are some bacteria that we call gram variable. And what that means is that depending on when you look at the gram stain for that particular culture, sometimes it might appear being gram positive, other times it might appear being gram negative. An example of this would be for bacillus and clostridium. And so think about when you think about bacillus and clostridium, what structure do those two bacteria both produce, which they have in common? And the answer is, is that they both produce endospores. Now, typically when we think of bacillus and clostridium, we would call those gram-positive organisms. However, if the cultures age, meaning if they've been growing in culture for long periods of times, they can start showing increasing numbers of gram-negative cells, meaning that for that organism, depending on when you gram stain it, sometimes it might appear gram-positive, other times it might appear gram-negative. And so now we're gonna look at atypical cell walls. So other types of cell walls that fall out of this gram positive or gram negative. And so the first one that we'll look at is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Remember that this is gonna be an example of an acid fast bacterium. And what that means is that their composition for their cell wall is atypical. And what that means is that in the case of mycobacterium, their cell wall is made of 60% mycolic acid. So they still have a thin layer of peptidoglycan, but outside of that peptidoglycan, they have that mycolic acid. And the mycolic acid is held together by a polysaccharide, so meaning multiple sugars put together. And so when we look at mycolic acid, remember that that type of cell wall is very waxy and very sticky. And so, one of the advantages to the bacteria for having mycolic acid is that the bacteria is very resistant to chemicals. So it's more difficult to treat with antibiotics. It's harder to clean, use and disinfectants. They're much more resistant to chemicals. In addition, they are also resistant to dehydration. Remember that I said that if you look at bacteria, most bacteria on a surface can only survive two to three days. When we look at mycobacteria, they're longer lived. They can survive on surfaces for up to six months. And so that bacteria is very resistant to dehydration. In addition, it's also resistant to phagocytic digestion, meaning that in your lungs, your lungs have these types of white blood cells that are called alveoli macrophages. And macrophages are cells that can do phagocytosis, meaning they can send out those extensions 
take in the bacteria, and normally those macrophages would then destroy that bacteria. But because mycobacterium has mycolic acid in their cell wall, what ends up happening is the macrophages can't digest the bacteria. They were able to take them in, but they can't break it down. And so what you get is these tubercules or these scar tissues that form in the lungs and the patients can actually start coughing up blood as a result. Only about 2% of patients get full-blown tuberculosis. HIV patients are more likely to die from this. This is one of the biggest killers in the world um, for HIV deaths, meaning that oftentimes HIV can lead to a compromised immune system, and then patients can actually die of a secondary infection because their immune system couldn't fight off, for example, this mycobacterium tuberculosis. And so um, this, these bacteria are resistant to phagocytic digestion. And again, they're also going to be resistant to chemicals. The next one that we're going to look at is going to be mycoplasma pneumoniae. And this causes primary atypical sorry, atypical um, walking pneumonia. And so if you've ever heard this term, walking pneumonia, this is basically where you get an infection in your lungs, but it's a less severe type of pneumonia, meaning walking, you might be able to still function and carry on, yet have this infection in your lungs. And so most, um, most pneumonia is actually caused by streptococcus pneumoniae, um, but a lot of lung infections are typically viral. And when you get a viral lung infection, sometimes you can then get a secondary infection from bacteria. And so when a patient has this mycoplasma pneumoniae in their lungs, and let's say the doctor decided to gram stain to try and determine what type of bacteria might be in the lungs, it's often missed by a gram stain. And the reason for that is that what makes mycoplasma unique is that they lack, so they lack a cell wall. They are one of the smallest bacterial cells. So they're about 0.2 micrometers, which if you remember like E. coli, for example, is about one micrometer. These are one fifth of that. So they're even smaller than um, most normal bacteria. And in fact, one of the reasons that it took so long for scientists to discover them is because they're so small. Originally, when they were discovered, they were mistaken for being a virus, but they're not. They're actually a bacteria. Because they lack a cell wall, they are pleomorphic, meaning they can take on um, multiple shapes. And one of the problems with not having a cell wall is that this bacteria is sensitive to dehydration and hypotonic environment. And so what I mean by hypotonic environments, we're going to talk more about this in a minute, but hypotonic means that the solution outside the cell has a lower solute concentration. Remember, solutes are things that can be dissolved. And so if you have a lot of water outside the cell relative to inside, what ends up happening is water will go into the cell. Now, bacterial cells, plant cells that have a cell wall, the cell wall can help restrain how much water can get into um, the bacteria. In the case of mycoplasma, because they lack a cell wall, they are more sensitive to damage 
from water rushing in than other types of bacteria. What ends up happening is that if too much water goes in, the cells undergo lysis, meaning that they break open. And so to help to try and combat this defect by not having a cell wall, they actually have these sterols in the cell membrane. And the sterols are typically so sterols are cholesterol-like. meaning they're lipids. And you're going to see in a minute that one of the functions of cholesterol in the cell membrane is to help to maintain the correct fluidity. And so because these bacteria lack a cell wall, those sterols, which are typically only found in eukaryotic cells, these sterols are present in these cells to help to protect from this lysis to protect from the bacteria rupturing and breaking up. Now, one of the problems with treating mycoplasma is that they can be difficult to treat with antibiotics because they lack a cell wall. And so if you think about penicillin, for example, penicillin is an antibiotic. You're going to see that targets peptidoglycan synthesis or cell wall synthesis. If, peptide, if, if mycoplasma lacks a cell wall, they don't have peptidoglycan, meaning that penicillin would not be effective against them. And so these are more difficult to treat because we don't have as many antibiotics that could be used to target this type of bacteria. And so the last little part for this part is going to be to look at what are some of the things that can damage cell walls. And so the first is going to be an enzyme called lysozyme. And lysozyme is an enzyme normally found in perspiration or sweat, um, in tears, mucus, and saliva. And your body produces the lysozyme as a defense mechanism. It's there to help inhibit microbial growth. And what it does is that it actually breaks down or digests the disaccharides in the peptidoglycan. And so because they break down that peptidoglycan, that causes damage to the cells. And when the cells get damaged, they might die um, as a result. Another example of a chemical that damages cell walls is going to be penicillin. Penicillin, again, is an antibiotic, and the way that it works is that it inhibits those peptide bridges in the peptidoglycan. And so, again, notice that both of these inhibit peptidoglycan. So what type of bacteria do you think might be affected most by lysozyme and penicillin? Is it going to be the gram positives or the gram negatives? And so think for a minute. And so you would come to the conclusion that these usually affect gram positive more. And that's because gram positives have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. And so because they have a thick layer of peptidoglycan, um, they are more sensitive to these chemicals. However, most of the organisms in your mouth are typically gram positive. For example, if you happen to carry Streptococcus pyogenes, that's the one that carries that causes strep throat. Streptococcus pyogenes is a gram positive bacteria. Yet they have acquired adaptations that actually allow them to survive even in the presence of lysozyme. And so they found a way basically to resist lysozyme. But again, typically lysozyme is going to inhibit peptidoglycan, which means that typically both of these chemicals are more going to affect gram positives relative to gram negatives. So I have a question for you. And the question says, the outer membrane of gram negative bacteria contains 
red, sterols, yellow, mycolic acid, green, tachoic acid, or blue, lipopolysaccharide. So I want you to pause, think about your answer, and then when you're ready, go ahead and turn the video back on. Okay, so if you said blue, you're correct, right? So gram-negative bacteria in the outer membrane have the lipopolysaccharide. So let's think about what bacteria have these other ones. So when we look at sterols, sterols again are found in mycoplasma, and that's because mycoplasma lacks a cell wall. And so to balance that, they have the sterols or these cholesterols in their cell membrane. Mycolic acid, which bacteria have mycolic acid? That's gonna be our mycobacterium. Mycobacteria. For our tachoic acids, our tachoic acids, remember, are going to be found in gram positive only. So gram negatives lack tachoic acid, gram positives have them. And so again, in the outer membrane, this is going to be the LPS the lipopolysaccharides. So now we're gonna move on and talk about the cell membrane. And so now we're gonna move from cell wall in. And so if we look at bacteria, for example, right, this is gonna be an example of gram-negative bacteria. Notice they have the outer membrane, they have peptidoglycan, and then now we come inside to the cell membrane. And so when we look at the cell membrane, the cell membrane is what we call the fluid mosaic model. And what that means is when we call the cell membrane a fluid mosaic, that means that the membrane is a fluid structure, meaning that it's not really rigid, it's more kind of liquidy and fluid. And the mosaic part of this is that for the cell membrane, um, it has these mosaic or these different types of proteins embedded in the membrane. And those proteins do a variety of things that you're going to see in a minute. If we look at a typical erythrocyte or red blood cell, the erythrocyte has about 50 different types of proteins embedded in the membrane. And that's only one cell type. And so cells can have lots and lots of different proteins embedded in the membrane. In addition, one of the main components of the cell membrane, remember, is our phospholipid bilayer. And our phospholipid bilayer, remember, is amphipathic. It has a hydrophilic head. So here's our hydrophilic head. And it has this hydrophobic tail. Hydrophobic means water-fearing. So notice that the tail is primarily hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are nonpolar, which means they don't have any charge to interact with water. And so if you see, this is how typically you'll see phospholipid simplified. So here's the head and the two tails. And so what happens is, is these phospholipids self-orient themselves so that the heads face outside the cell and the heads face inside the cell where water is available and the tails orient themselves in the middle, and that's to shield them away from the water. And so you get this phospholipid bilayer. These two layers of phospholipids, heads face outside and inside the cell, and the tails are shielded in the middle. Now, what is the function of the cell membrane? Well, if you think about prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, remember that we said that prokaryotic cells typically lack membrane-bound organelles, meaning that they lack mitochondria. Mitochondria is a membrane-bound organelle that allows eukaryotic cells to carry out cellular respiration, break down glucose, convert it into ATP chemical energy. Prokaryotic cells like bacteria don't have that membrane-bound organelle. And you're going to see that part of cellular respiration takes place embedded in the membrane of the mitochondria. 
because bacteria lack that mitochondria, it doesn't mean that they can't do cellular respiration. They can, they're still able to take chemical energy and convert it into ATP, but to do so, they actually synthesize ATP in their cell membrane. And that's unique. Eukaryotic cells do not. Eukaryotic cells make ATP in mitochondria. Prokaryotic cells make their ATP embedded in the membrane of the bacterial cell. And so that is one of the things that has to happen in bacteria. In addition, we also get nutrient processing, meaning the membrane is going to be selectively permeable. It's going to regulate what goes into and out of the cell, meaning we don't want anything and everything to come in and out, but we also don't want nothing to come in and out. And so the membrane is going to be used to transport things like glucose, for example, into and out of the cell. And it also allows the bacteria to process those nutrients to basically, um, a lot of times there's enzymes that help break down those nutrients. And so when we look at prokaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells typically are going to lack sterols or they lack the cholesterol in the membrane that eukaryotic cells will have. And you'll see why that's important in a little bit. So this is just showing you the fluid mosaic model. And again, what that means is that the membrane is a fluid structure and the membrane is about as viscous as olive oil. So again, you don't want it to be too solid. Another example of a lipid that's solid would be butter, right? You wouldn't want your membrane to be like butter so that nothing could get in and out. You also don't want the membrane to be so fluid that it can't regulate what goes into and out. And so when we look at this phospholipid bilayer, there's no covalent bonds holding those phospholipids together. What's holding these phospholipids together are actually the hydrophobic interactions between the tails. And that interaction is what's going to keep the membrane to be fluid. Because again, if they were covalent bonds holding those together, that's a rather rigid bond. But because it's just hydrophobic interactions, those are weak interactions, and the phospholipids actually move side to side very freely. Occasionally, they can rotate from one phospholipid leaflet to the other, but that's a lot less likely. They can, though, go side to side, and that's because they are this fluid structure. And then there are proteins, which you're going to see in a minute, do a variety of things inside the bacteria. So when we look at the cell membrane and we compare between prokaryotic and eukaryotic membranes, there are several things that they have in common. And the first is that primarily they're both made of a phospholipid bilayer. And so we talked about the phospholipids when we looked at our lecture on macromolecules. And in this case for the membrane, it's going to be primarily the phospholipid bilayer. In addition, there are the integral and the peripheral proteins, which we just talked about, that do a variety of different things inside the cell. Now, in addition to similarities, there are also differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell membranes. For example, remember when we talked about cell walls and we talked about that there's a type of bacteria that lacks a cell wall. And so think for a minute, which of the bacteria that we talked about lacks a cell wall? And the answer is going to be mycoplasma. And so for mycoplasma, because they lack that cell wall, they also have the sterols or the cholesterol embedded in the membrane to help keep the correct fluidity. Most eukaryotic organisms like animals use cholesterol as their sterols for fungi the sterol in the media or in the membrane is a little bit different. It's something called ergosterol. And so sterols are typically unique to eukaryotic cells, except in the case of mycoplasma. In addition, for eukaryotic cells, they often use carbohydrates embedded in the membrane that are used for both attachment and for cell-cell recognition, 
like we saw for the glycocalyx. So the cell membrane has four main components, a phospholipid bilayer, cholesterol, proteins, and something called glycocalyx. And so we're gonna talk about what do each of those four components do. And if you recall back to our lecture on macromolecules, we talked about phospholipids. And remember that phospholipids are amphipathic, meaning that they have both a hydrophilic portion and a hydrophobic portion. And if you remember, hydro is referring to water. And if you think of a phobia, a phobia is a fear, right? If I'm arachnophobic, I'm afraid of spiders. The hydrophilic heads are water loving. And for those, those are gonna face both inside the cell and outside the cell where water is present. The middle part of the membrane are made up of these fatty acid tails and the fatty acid tails, remember, are hydrophobic. They're water fearing. And so they're actually shielded from the water that's both inside the cell and outside the cell. And so the main component of the membrane is gonna be this phospholipid bilayer. And this is really important because the membrane is a very fluid structure. And so the phospholipids themselves also help to maintain the correct fluidity. Another component for the fluidity of the membrane is the cholesterol. And when we think of cholesterol, we typically have a negative connotation in our head, right? You think of, oh, I need to make sure my cholesterol is not too high. But in fact, your cells actually require cholesterol in order to function. And so cholesterol, in some instances, is actually a good thing. And the cholesterol in the membrane is there to basically keep the correct fluidity, meaning that it prevents the membrane from packing in too tightly and making a very solid structure. And it also prevents the membrane from becoming too fluid in which it couldn't regulate what goes into or out of the cell. And so cholesterol is very important in keeping the cell membrane the correct fluidity. The next component are gonna be the proteins. And for the proteins, we're gonna talk about the functions in a minute. Um, proteins have a variety of functions in a cell. If you think of an erythrocyte, which is a red blood cells, um, erythrocytes have about 50 different types of proteins embedded in the membrane. Some of these proteins are what we call integral proteins meaning that they're actually embedded in the membrane. And some of these proteins are gonna be peripheral proteins, which are just associated with the membrane. The next and last component is gonna be the glycocalyx. And these are basically gonna be sugars that attach to proteins or phospholipids, and they serve as binding sites and as cell lubrication and adhesion molecules. They basically are there to help also with cell-cell recognition meaning that two cells can recognize one another. So we're going to talk for a minute about what do those proteins do in the membrane. And remember that I said that if we look at an erythrocyte, which is a red blood cell, a red blood cell has 50 different types of proteins. And so you can probably imagine that if it has that many different types of proteins, that they probably do very diverse things in the cell. And so one of the things that proteins do in the membrane is for transport. These are gonna allow substances to flow through these hydrophilic channels. Some things can cross the membrane on their own to get into and out of the cell. Others need a little bit of help. And so that help is through these proteins. And we're gonna talk about these more um, later in the lecture. Another function is gonna be for enzymatic activity. And these basically are enzymes that are gonna speed up chemical reactions they help chemical reactions to go faster. And again, at the end of this lecture, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about what enzymes are and how they function. Another really important component um, of proteins in the membrane is that some of these proteins act as what are called signal transduction pathways. And basically what that means is that these receptors have what's called a ligand. And a ligand is a signaling molecule. And the ligand and the receptors are very, very specific. And when a ligand comes in and it signals and it binds to the receptor, that initiates some sort of signal transduction pathway inside the cell that tells the cell what to do. For example, if you got a cut and you had a wound, you probably know that that wound is not gonna stay there forever. Eventually that wound is gonna heal. And one of the things that's gonna happen is the cells in the area of the wound 
are gonna send growth factors to the cells in the area, telling them to divide to repair the damaged tissue. And so these growth factors get sent and the growth factors themselves are gonna be the ligand and cells have receptors for those growth factors and that then sends a signal to tell that cell to divide. And so these are called signal transduction pathways. They're basically a way to relay a signal to allow cells to communicate with each other. Another important function of a membrane is cell-cell recognition. And this basically is gonna serve as identification tags recognized by other cells. So if you remember in our cell lecture where we looked at the video of the uh, white blood cell chasing the bacteria, you'll remember that the white blood cell didn't engulf the red blood cells. It recognized that those cells were self and that not to engulf its own red blood cells. However, it did recognize a signaling molecule on the bacteria. And when it came to the bacteria, you'll remember that it engulfed and it took in that bacteria. And so there are these proteins, typically glycoproteins, that help with cell-cell recognition. The next is gonna be for intercellular joining. So allowing two cells to join together and kind of holding them together. And then lastly, um, attachment to the cytoskeleton, and what's called the extracellular matrix. And this is basically there to help maintain cell shape and to coordinate changes to the cell shape. And so this is gonna be important for uh, maintaining cell shape. And so we're gonna talk about now traffic across the membrane. How do we get molecules into or out of the cell? And traffic across the membrane is essential you have to be able to get things into and out of the cell in order for the cell to survive. And if you think about it, for example, think of your own cells. If you don't eat, your cells can't survive. Your cells need to be able to take in molecules for energy. We're not plants, we can't make our own energy. And so the way that we get our energy is by eating food. Right, And so our cells need to be able to take in those sugars and take in those amino acids and take in all the other um, essential nutrients that our cell needs to survive. And so obviously then cells need to be able to take in different molecules for energy. They also need to be able to get rid of metabolic waste products. So things that the cell no longer needs. If you think of breathing, for example, right? You breathe in oxygen and you exhale carbon dioxide. And you're gonna see later that the reason for this gas exchange is for cellular respiration. And carbon dioxide is gonna be a waste product of cellular respiration, and the cells need to be able to get rid of it, and the cells will have the carbon dioxide leave. It'll go through the bloodstream to the lungs, and you exhale it out. Additionally, cells need to be able to take in and expel many important ions. Sodium and potassium, for example. So if you look at this image here, here are the sodium and potassium channels. And neurons, which are the nervous system cells that communicate with one another, the way that neurons fire is simply through a change in the distribution of ions. And the way that these ions move is through these sodium or potassium channels. And all an, an action potential or a neuron firing really is is a change in voltage, which is a result of a change in the ion distribution across the cell membrane. And so being able to move these ions um, is essential. If we think about calcium, right? You probably have been told when you were younger that you needed to drink, let's say, milk for calcium for your bones. So cells need to have calcium. Chloride, chloride is an ion, and chloride we'll talk about later um, a disease that results from defective chloride ions is, or from defective chloride channels is gonna be cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis causes these defective chloride channels. And we'll talk about later about how that affects the movement of water across the membrane. So when we look at the phospholipid bilayer, remember that the bilayer is made up primarily of phospholipids. And again, phospholipids are amphipathic, 
meaning they have these hydrophilic heads and these hydrophobic nonpolar tails. And so the way that the membrane orients itself, again, is that the heads, which are hydrophilic, want to interact with the water both outside the cell and inside the cell. And the tails that are hydrophobic want to be shielded from the water and they're going to be in the middle. So when we look at this membrane, again, there's a part that's hydrophilic and there's a portion that's hydrophobic. And this is going to basically have an effect on what types of things can cross or do not cross the cell membrane. So the things that can cross the membrane on their own are gonna be things that are hydrophobic. So hydrophobic and hydrophobic, oil and oil, can interact with one another. And so these hydrophobic molecules are gonna be able to get through this hydrophobic core and get into the cell freely. And so this is gonna be things like steroids. So think about um, testosterone, estrogen, which are steroid hormones. Those can cross the cell membrane on their own. Also, small hydrocarbons. Remember that carbon and hydrogen, similar electronegativities, and so when they bond, they're gonna form nonpolar covalent bonds, meaning they're gonna share the electrons equally, and they're also gonna be hydrophobic. And so small hydrocarbons can cross the membrane on their own, as well as nonpolar small molecules like carbon dioxide and oxygen. Because again, if they're nonpolar, they're also gonna be hydrophobic, which will allow them to be able to get through this hydrophobic core of the cell membrane. The things that cannot cross are things that are hydrophilic. And that's because hydrophilic molecules cannot interact with this hydrophobic core. So think of hydrophilic like water, can't interact with oil, which is like this hydrophobic part. So a good rule of thumb is if something dissolves in water, it can't cross the membrane on its own. And so that includes things like salt, right? If you remember back to salt, salt is sodium chloride, and those are ions. And sodium is a positive ion, chloride is a negative ion. These are hydrophilic. They'll interact with water, and therefore they cannot get through this hydrophobic core, and these ions can't cross the membrane on their own. Another example, glucose, right? Think of sugar, for example. If you took sugar and you dissolved it in your coffee, it would dissolve. And that's because sugars are polar. And if they're polar, they're hydrophilic. And again, things that are hydrophilic cannot cross this hydrophobic interior of the membrane. Um, amino acids, which are, remember, the building blocks for proteins, those are also polar and therefore cannot cross this hydrophobic core. So the things that cannot cross, hydrophilic molecules, charged ions, or very large molecules. All of those components make it so they cannot cross the membrane on their own and they need help. So we're gonna talk now about diffusion. And diffusion is the movement of molecules or ions from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. And so I want you to imagine for a minute that you have a beaker of water or a glass of water. If you take that glass of water and you put in drops of food coloring, for example, you'll notice that when you put that food coloring in, those drops of dye don't stay as drops forever. That dye is gonna start to move and spread out. It's gonna go from its high concentration as a drop to the low concentration, which is the water around it right because when you put the drop in the high concentration is where you put it in the low concentration is going to be the water around it and so those dye molecules are going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration and they'll continue to move and they'll continue to to um, spread out until eventually they're evenly distributed in the, in the water and at that point we would say that they've reached equilibrium now, when we talk about things going from a high concentration to low, you'll hear the term going down the concentration gradient. And if you think about it, going from high concentration to low, right, so that dye going from its high concentration to low, that's a favorable reaction. That will happen on its own. I don't have to do anything 
to make those dye molecules spread out. And so when we talk about a concentration gradient, there's two ways. Things can go up a concentration gradient or they can go down. And now think about which one is more favorable, which one's going to happen spontaneously. Will things roll, let's say, down a hill or spontaneously will they go up a hill? And you guys probably all know based on gravity that by default, without anything happening, things would go down a hill. That's a spontaneous process. Going down a hill doesn't require anything. Going up a hill, though, requires energy. And so diffusion, because we're going from higher to lower, and that's favorable, and that happens spontaneously, we say that that's moving these molecules down the concentration gradient. And again, this is a spontaneous process. No energy is required, but it is dependent on the thermal motion of molecules. Because remember that molecules have inherent movement. They bounce around. And if you think about what you learned back when you were a kid, if you heat something up, what happens to molecular motion? And if you think about it for a minute, you might recall that if you heat something up, molecules move faster. And so if those molecules are starting to move faster, do you think that diffusion is gonna happen faster at warmer temperatures or at cooler temperatures? And so think about that for a minute. Will it happen faster at warmer temperatures or at cooler temperatures? And you might come up with that it's gonna happen faster at warmer temperatures because at warmer temperatures, molecular motion is gonna speed up, which means that those molecules are gonna move faster and they're gonna evenly distribute at a faster rate. And so again, the molecules are gonna bounce around and eventually spread out until they reach equilibrium. And so here's a different example of this. Here on the left, we have this beaker and it has a membrane and this membrane is permeable to the dye, meaning that these molecules of dye can cross the membrane. And so if we put dye only on one side, these molecules of dye are gonna move from their higher concentration on the left to the lower concentration on the right. But notice that the dye molecules don't exclusively go to the right. Some of them by chance will happen to go back to the left. It's just that net movement, meaning uh, it's more going to be towards the right. And those molecules are gonna move towards the right until they evenly spread out, at which point we would say that they're at equilibrium. Now, when molecules reach equilibrium, does that mean they stop moving? And the answer is no. Molecules always move even at equilibrium. It's just that those molecules don't have net movement, meaning they're not going one way or the other faster in either direction. The movement to the right equals the movement to the left. And so that's an important concept is molecules always move even at equilibrium. So water also has thermal motion and it will also bounce around and work to spread out. And water will also move down the concentration gradient, meaning that it will go from its high concentration, so that's what these brackets represent, that refers to concentration. So it's gonna go from its high water concentration to its low water concentration. And so to understand how this works, we need to kind of review and talk about water. And so remember that water, H2O, is an oxygen covalently bound to two hydrogens. And if you remember back to our water lecture, you'll remember that water is polar, meaning that even though oxygen and hydrogen share electrons, they don't share equally. And that has to do again with electronegativity. And if you remember back to that lecture, and we talked about electronegativity, is oxygen or is hydrogen more electronegative? And so remember that we said that the atom that is going to have a greater electronegativity is going to be the one that has its outer shell more full. And so if you remember back to oxygen, oxygen has six valence electrons in its second shell of electrons, which means that oxygen only needs two more to fill its outer shell. Hydrogen, on the other hand, has one electron in its first shell, and it only needs one more to fill its outer shell. So hydrogen is only half full, whereas oxygen has six out of eight, meaning it's more than half full. And so if you think about oxygen and hydrogen, that then means that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. And what that means is that because it's more electronegative, when they share electrons, they don't share equally. 
It's like a tug of war. Oxygen wants those electrons more. And so the electrons are going to spend more time around the oxygen and less time around the hydrogen. And so as oxygen pulls harder for those electrons, oxygen gets a partial negative charge because electrons are negative. And if the negatively charged electrons spend more time around oxygen, it's a partial negative charge, which means then that the hydrogens get a partial positive charge. And that's because the electron spends more time with oxygen, which leaves hydrogens as just a proton, and the electron is spending more of the time around oxygen, so it's partially positive. And so what you get is water, again, is polar. It has a part that's partially negative, which is the oxygen, and a part that's partially positive, which is the hydrogens. Now, when we talked about solutes, Remember that a solute is something that dissolves in water. So in this diagram, this diagram showing it as a sugar, but it just as easily could be something like uh, salt, right? You know that you can dissolve salt in water. So I'm going to show you a diagram using salt as an example because it's a little more simple. And if you remember back to our lecture talking about salt, salt, remember, is just simply sodium ions and chloride ions. And sodium ions are positively charged. Chloride ions are negatively charged. And so remember that when we talked about interactions between atoms, opposites attract. And so what's going to happen is that negatively charged chloride ion is going to be attracted to the partial positive hydrogens. And we get these hydration shells. Sodium, on the other hand, has a positive charge and it's going to interact with that partially negative oxygen. And so what happens is, is the reason that salt dissolves in water is because the water molecules interact with the sodium and the chloride and they separate them from each other. So if on the left you have a lower solute concentration and on the right you have a solute, higher solute concentration, that means that on the right side where we have more sugar, we have less free water. And what I mean by this is in this case, this membrane is selectively permeable. And what that means is that some things can cross the membrane, others cannot. And in this case, our solute is not able to get across the membrane. Only the water can move. And so we can't say that the solute is going to move from the right to the left because it can't cross the membrane. So what we need to focus on is which direction the water will move. And so to think about which way the water will move, wherever we have a higher solute concentration, wherever that solute's present, water is going to be attached to it. And if you remember, the solute can't cross the membrane. And so on this side where we have more, uh, more solutes, we have less free water because the water is not free to move it's bound to the solute. On this left side here, we have a lower, lower concentration of solutes, but we have more free water, more water that's not bound to a solute that's free to move. And so we have more free water here, less free water here, and remember that things are gonna go always from high concentration to low. So it's gonna go from its high concentration of water here to low concentration of water here. And water is gonna move to the right and it's gonna start to fill up the tube on this side. And so again, just like all other molecules, water is also gonna move from a high concentration to low. And when you're looking for which way water moves, it's always going to be from the low solute concentration, which is where you're going to have more free water, to the high solute concentration, where you have less free water. So either way is fine to remember it if you want to remember that it moves from low solute to high solute. But for me, I would rather remember that things always go from high to low. And so I always like to remember that it's going to move from here, where it has more free water, or a higher water concentration to this side where it has a lower water concentration. And so this is gonna be referred to as osmosis. Okay, and osmosis is the diffusion of water. Now, tonicity is the ability of a solution to cause a cell to gain or to lose water. And you always need to compare two solutions because water or a cell is only gonna gain or lose water depending on solute concentration. And in order for this to work, it must be separated by a water permeable membrane, meaning that water can move. Because how can a cell gain or lose water 
if water can't move. And you have to be really careful when you start talking about tonicity because you need to pay attention to which of the two solutions you're referring to. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So the first one that we'll talk about is a hypertonic solution. And if you think of a kid that's hyperactive, do they have more energy or less energy? And you'll probably recall that if a kid is hyperactive, they have more energy. So the word hyper refers to more. The hypertonic solution is the one that has a higher solute concentration. And so notice that in this case, here in white, this is our cell, and our cell is placed in a solution, and that solution has more solutes outside. And so we would say that the solution outside is hypertonic relative to the cell. Because again, hyper means more. So this solution is hypertonic relative to the cell. And remember that anywhere that solute is, water is gonna be associated with it. So all these little red dots here are referring to water. And notice that if there's more solutes outside, that means that this outside solution has less free water. Notice that there's only, in this case, one water molecule that's free to move. If we look inside the cell, which has a lower solute concentration, it's gonna have more free water because the solute concentration is lower and there's more water molecules that are free to move. So inside the cell, we have more free water. And so think about it for a minute. Which way is the water gonna move? Is it gonna go into the cell or is it gonna go out of the cell? And so think about it. So where is the water gonna go? And if you think about it, it's gonna go from its high concentration inside the cell to the low concentration outside. What you're gonna see is that water is gonna move out of the cell. Now, we're gonna talk about for each of these solutions what you're gonna see in both an animal cell and in a plant cell. And remember that a difference between plant and animal cells is that plant cells have a rigid cell wall. Animal cells do not. And so this is gonna affect the way that water moves in a plant cell versus an animal cell. So in an animal cell, when the water moves out from a hypertonic solution, so as the water goes out, animal cell is gonna shrivel up. For the plant cell, the water's still gonna go out, but the whole cell is not gonna shrivel up because it has that rigid cell wall. Instead, you're gonna see something called plasmolysis. And what that means is that as the water goes out, the cell membrane is gonna shrink in away from the cell wall. So it's like the membrane kind of collapses in, but the cell wall stays out here. And so in plant cells, this is referred to as plasmolysis. And you're actually gonna visualize this um, in lab this week. Now, let's look at what's gonna happen if you place a cell in a hypotonic solution. And hypo is less. So remember that if hyper is more, hypo is the opposite, it's less. So in this case, it's the solution with a lower solute concentration. So in this case, the, the solution outside is hypotonic relative to the cell because it has a lower solute concentration compared to the cell. And so when we look at water concentration, remember that if we have more solutes inside, less solutes outside, that means that we have more free water outside. And so think about it, which way is the water gonna move if you put a cell in a hypotonic solution. And so if you think about it, water's gonna go from its high concentration in the solution to the low concentration inside the cell, and the water in this case is gonna move into the cell. And the way that I remember that is if you put a cell in a hypotonic solution, water's gonna go in, the cell's gonna swell, and it's gonna become a big O. So hype O, cell's gonna become a big O, okay? And so water's gonna go in, cell's gonna swell. And so that's gonna look different if you talk about an animal cell versus a plant cell. In an animal cell, 
if you put it in a hypotonic solution, the water's gonna go in, the cell's gonna swell, there's no cell wall to restrain how much water goes in, and the cell's gonna lyse and it's gonna burst open. Think about for a minute if you've ever been dehydrated and you had to go to the hospital to get an IV. You probably know that if you go to the hospital, they're not gonna put pure water into your IV. They're gonna put a saline solution. And that's because they don't wanna create a hypotonic solution outside your cells so that all the water is gonna rush in and your cells are gonna burst or lice open. And you can actually die from water intoxication. It's something called hyponatremia. And it happens sometimes in marathon runners when they sweat too much, if they drink just pure water, you create a hypotonic environment outside the cells, too much water goes in, and your cells would start to lice. And so again, this is why in a hospital, if you're dehydrated, they're not gonna put pure water in there. They're gonna put a saline solution that has some solutes so that you don't have too much water rushing into your cell. If you think about a plant cell, however, if you water a plant, you don't use salt water or saline to water your plant. You just use tap water where the solute concentration is low. You are putting your plant in a hypotonic solution. And in a plant cell, that's actually a favorable reaction because as the water goes in, it creates some pressure inside that cell and that makes the cell become turgid. It creates what's called turgor pressure. And that pressure inside the cell from the inside pushing on the cell wall that pressure is gonna make the cell very rigid, very firm, and that's what allows the plant to stand upright. It needs that turgor pressure. So in a plant, you wanna put the plant cell in a hypotonic solution because you want the water to go in to create that pressure. But again, animal cell, not good to put it in a hypotonic solution because the water is gonna go in, no cell wall to restrain it, and the water is gonna cause the cell to go pop and burst open, that's called lysis. Now, back to the slide about tonicity, and I said about um, always make sure to pay attention to which solution you're paying it, or which solution you're talking about. So notice in this case, we can say that the solution, the solution is hypotonic, but the cell we could also call hypertonic. So we could say that the cell is hypertonic relative to the solution, right? It has more solutes relative to the solution. So again, always be careful when you're using the terms hypertonic and hypotonic, which one are you referring to? Are you talking about the solution or are you talking about inside the cell? And so in this scenario, the solution is hypotonic relative to the cell or you could say the cell is hypertonic relative to the solution. And the last scenario is if you put a cell in an isotonic solution. Iso refers to same. And this is where you have an equal solute concentration on both sides of the membrane. So notice one, two, three, one, two, three. Solute concentration is the same which means that the water concentration is also the same. Notice one, two free water molecules, one, two. And so what that means is you have an equal concentration of water on either side of the membrane. And so think about that for a minute. Does that mean that the water won't move? And if you think about it, right, you might recall that molecules always move even at equilibrium. And so it's not that you don't get any movement, you just don't get net movement. Water is gonna go into the cell and out of the cell at the same rate. And so the water is equally gonna move in both directions. So if you put an animal cell in an isotonic solution, water is gonna go in and out at the same rate. That's gonna be a normal animal cell. Again, you want your cells to be in an isotonic solution. For a plant cell, however, that's not a good thing. Again, you want that pressure inside the cell in order to make the cell firm so that the plant stands up. 
if you were to water your plant with an isotonic solution where the water is going into and out of the cell, the cell is going to be flaccid. And if it's flaccid, it's not firm and your plant's going to wilt. And so best scenario for an animal cell, isotonic solution, best scenario for a plant cell would be to actually put it in a hypotonic solution so that the water goes in. And so I have a class paper for you. So if you're stranded on an island, should you drink the ocean water to quench your thirst? Why or why not? So when you're ready, go ahead and pause this and think about your answer and write down what you would have answered had you been in class. And then when you're ready, go ahead and turn the video back on and listen to the answer. So go ahead, pause it. Okay, so let's go over the answer. So if you're stranded on an island, should you drink the ocean water? The answer is no, because if you drink the ocean water, which is salt water, right? Think about what happens. If you drink ocean water, you're creating a hypertonic solution outside your cells, which means there's more free water in your cells and the water is gonna go out of the cells and that's gonna cause your cells actually to become more dehydrated. And so if this continued to happen, this would lead to dehydration and in extreme cases, death. Okay, and so you would not wanna drink pure ocean water because again, drinking salt water would cause you to become more dehydrated. And then this last one, here's a series of questions and the answers will be posted on Blackboard for you to use to study. So I want you to work on these and then after you've worked on these, you can check your answers with those that are posted on Blackboard. And so this is gonna conclude part one of the video and when you're ready, you can go on to part two. And we're gonna start by talking about transport of molecules or ions across a membrane. So how do things actually get into or out of the cell? So the first type of transport is referred to as passive transport. And it's passive because no energy is required. This is the use for the transport of molecules or ions down the concentration gradient. And remember that that means moving things from a high concentration to low. And going from high to low, remember, is down the gradient because that's favorable, right? If I put a ball on the edge of a hill, it's spontaneously going to go down. And same thing for molecules going from a high concentration to low, that's a favorable reaction. Right, remember our beaker with water? If I put dye into that beaker, it's gonna move from its high concentration as a drop to the low concentration in the solution surrounding it. And so again, passive transport is used to transport molecules or ions down the concentration gradient, which is a favorable reaction. And there are two main types of passive transport. The first is gonna be simple diffusion. And in simple diffusion, no transport protein is necessary. This is used for things that can cross the plasma membrane on their own. And remember that we said that the things that can cross the membrane on their own without the help of a transporter are going to be things that are small, hydrophobic, and nonpolar. And so things that are small, hydrophobic, and nonpolar can get through that interior of the plasma membrane, which is also hydrophobic. So things like um, steroid hormones, testosterone estrogen. Those are made of primarily hydrocarbons and hydrocarbons are nonpolar and therefore hydrophobic. Molecular oxygen, so oxygen gas, carbon dioxide, those are both nonpolar. They can cross the membrane all on their own. The only thing, the only requirement for passive or for simple diffusion is that it's going to move from a high concentration to low. And so notice that in this image that you see here, it's going to move from its high concentration to low. So the only thing that's required is a concentration gradient. Now, um, in contrast to simple diffusion, we have what's referred to as facilitated diffusion. And this is basically that the diffusion is facilitated by these transport proteins. So this is used for things that cannot cross the membrane on their own. They still will go down the gradient, meaning they'll go from the high concentration to low, but these molecules can't get through the hydrophobic core of the cell membrane. And so what's needed is this transport protein. 
and this transport protein, like for example, this one here, that's a channel protein, and it basically provides a hydrophilic corridor, meaning that the amino acids from this protein that are in the middle are also hydrophilic, which allow these hydrophilic molecules to be able to cross the membrane. And so this is gonna be used for ions and polar molecules. Um, an example of this, aquaporins. If you think of aqua, you think of water. Porins are pores. Aquaporins are channels that allow water to cross into or out of the cell. There are also what are called carrier proteins. And these are transmembrane proteins that not only provide a corridor for things to cross, but they actually change their conformation, which is their shape, upon binding to the solute. So on one side, it'll open up, the solute will come in and bind, the transport protein will change its shape, and now open up to the inside and release that solute into the cell, for example. Again, these are going to go from high concentration to low because they're passive transport. They don't require energy. This is in contrast to active transport. And in active transport, it requires both a transport protein to help move that molecular ion, plus it requires energy. And that energy that's required is usually in the form of ATP. And this type of transport is used to transport molecules or ions up the concentration gradient. Up, remember if you were to push something up a hill, up requires energy. So you would have to put in energy to get a ball, say, up a hill. Same thing if you're gonna transport things up the gradient. If you're transporting things up the gradient, it requires energy. And this is used to transport things from a low concentration to a high. If you think about that beaker that's um, that has water and has a drop of dye in it, that dye, remember, is naturally gonna go from its high concentration as a drop to the low concentration around it. And if you think about it, is that dye ever gonna go from a low concentration to high? Meaning, is it ever gonna go from where it's spread out and all of a sudden spontaneously concentrate itself back into a drop? And the answer is no. Things will not spontaneously go from a low concentration to a high concentration. And so that requires energy, which is why we call it active transport. You actively have to do something to move these molecules or ions up the gradient. Some examples of this, ion pumps, for example, here you're seeing a proton pump, and a proton pump, like you can imagine, pumps protons. Protons are simply hydrogen ions. Remember that all hydrogen is. A normal hydrogen atom is one proton, one electron. When we talk about a, a hydrogen ion, in a hydrogen ion, it gives up its electron, and what you're left with is H+. It has positive charge, because all that's left is a proton. So that's why we call H plus protons. And in the proton pump, we're gonna pump hydrogens against the gradient. So from a low concentration to a high, and because that's an unfavorable reaction, it requires energy in the form of ATP. Now, this type of pump is what we call electrogenic. And what that means is that it generates a charge difference across the membrane what we call a voltage. So as we pump hydrogens into the extracellular fluid, which is the fluid outside the cell, you're creating an environment where the extracellular fluid is positively charged relative to the inside of the cell. And so that's creating a voltage difference. It's a difference of charge across the membrane. Another example that doesn't have a diagram here, but is still important, is the sodium potassium pump. And sodium potassium pumps are used for neurons. Um, when a neuron normally does an action potential, okay, meaning that the neuron fires, that is caused by a change in the voltage across the membrane. And in order to turn off that neuron again, sodium and potassium pumps need to go against the gradient to reset that voltage so that the neuron can fire again. And so again, these are gonna be electrogenic. They generate a voltage or a charge difference across the membrane. Co-transporters, 
requires two transmembrane proteins. One is gonna pump a molecule up the concentration gradient, so meaning it's gonna go from a low concentration to high, and one that's gonna let the molecule flow back down the gradient. And so the downhill movement is coupled to the uphill movement of another molecule. And an example of this is the sucrose proton transporter. And so if we look at this co-transporter, here it's coupled with a proton pump, and a proton pump is going to pump hydrogens against the gradient. So again, moving it from its low concentration to its high concentration out here. Now, as hydrogens go down the gradient, going from high to low, that energy that it gives off by going down the gradient is enough to help sucrose get into the cell. And so again, this is referred to as co-transport. It is active though, because it requires either ATP or some other favorable reaction to power the movement against the gradient. So now we're gonna talk about bulk transport across the membrane. So how do we get large bulky molecules either into the cell or out? And we're gonna talk about exocytosis and endocytosis. Exocytosis, okay, exo is referring to exit. This is how the cell gets large things out of the cell. And the way that this works is that these lipid vesicles are made in the cell and eventually those vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane and release the contents to outside the cell. Um, and if you remember in our lecture about um, cell structures, we talked about the protein production pathway. And in the protein production pathway, proteins go from the rough endoplasmic reticulum, they bud off in a vesicle, that vesicle takes the protein, it fuses with the Golgi apparatus. And the Golgi apparatus is gonna modify, it's gonna sort the proteins, and it's gonna ship them, and that protein's gonna leave in a vesicle, and the vesicle moves along, it fuses with the cell membrane, and it releases those secreted proteins out of the cell. And so this is how a cell secretes materials, like, for example, proteins, again, for our protein production pathway, hormones, so insulin, for example. Insulin is made in pancreatic beta cells. So in your pancreas, you have a special group of cells that's responsible for producing insulin. And when you eat, your body recognizes that sugar is available. So when you guys eat, your blood sugar begins to rise. And as your blood sugar goes up, your body recognizes that there's sugar available and your pancreatic beta cells produce insulin and they release insulin into the bloodstream. Insulin travels throughout your body and it serves as the signal to tell your cells to take up glucose because all the cells in your body require glucose for energy um, to make ATP, so for cellular respiration, for example. And so insulin is that signal that tells your cells that glucose is available. And so cells in the pancreas need to release that insulin so that that hormone can go through your bloodstream and circulate and tell all the cells in your body to take up glucose. This is also how neurotransmitters get released. And so the way that two neurons communicate with each other is that one neuron that's already fired is gonna release a neurotransmitter to an adjacent neuron. When that adjacent neuron receives that neurotransmitter, now you get an action potential. You get a, neur a, a neuron to fire for the adjacent cell. And so neurotransmitters are how neurons communicate with one another. This is also how the cell membrane grows. Because if you think about it, these vesicles that are made here are basically components of the cell membrane. And so as these vesicles fuse with the cell membrane, you're gonna increase the surface area of the cell membrane, and you're gonna increase the cell membrane. Now, in contrast to exocytosis, which is how we get things out of the cell. Indo refers to in, getting things into the cell. 
And so endocytosis is how we get large molecules or particles into the cell. One of these types, one of the types of endocytosis is something referred to as phagocytosis. And in phagocytosis, you can think of this like cellular eating. And what the cell does is it sends out these extensions and these extensions are referred to as pseudopodia. And if you remember back to our lecture on um, cell organelles, remember that we talked about cytoskeletal elements and specifically we talked about actin. And actin is the cytoskeletal element that's responsible for producing pseudopodia. If you remember into our video of the white blood cell chasing the bacteria, when that white blood cell came to the bacteria, it sent out those projections and engulfed and took that bacteria into the cell. That's phagocytosis. Okay, and so the cell is gonna send out these pseudopodia. It's going to fuse the pseudopodia together and engulf that food and other particles into the cell into a food vacuole. And then that food vacuole can get broken down and take in the food. Or if it's not food, if it's let's say bacteria, okay, the cell is going to engulf that bacteria. The white blood cell will engulf the bacteria. The bacteria, remember, would fuse with the lysosome and the lysosome would then break down that foreign bacteria. And so this is used to ingest larger particles, things like bacteria, viruses, fungi, lots of food molecules, for example. All of these things would use phagocytosis. This is in contrast, another type of endocytosis is referred to as pinocytosis. Pinocytosis is pinching in. So the cell in this case does not send out extensions. It simply pinches in and it creates kind of this pocket. And this little pocket is gonna take in any of the liquid that's outside here. And it's a very non-specific type of endocytosis, meaning whatever's out here is gonna be incorporated into that vesicle. And you can think of this kind of as cellular drinking because again, it's not going out, it's not taking in food. All it's doing is the membrane is pinching in. Any fluid that's outside is gonna become incorporated into this vesicle. And that's how the cell's gonna get in some of the solutes um, that it uses. And the last type of endocytosis is something called receptor-mediated endocytosis. So receptors are proteins and they have a binding site for a type of molecule referred to as a ligand. And receptors are very, very specific. So if we look at this receptor, it has a ligand that would bind to it and a cell would recognize when the ligand bound to the receptor and when it did, it would form this coated pit and it would take in large amounts of this ligand in a very specific manner. Because again, these receptors are specific for certain ligands. And so this allows the cells to take in very specific ligands, very specific types of molecules. Example of this, um, LDL. So if you've ever had your cholesterol checked, You've probably heard a little bit about LDL. LDL stands for low density lipoproteins. And these low density lipoproteins, these are these cholesterol carriers. And remember that cholesterol is important for the cell. Again, even though we think of cholesterol as being a bad thing, cholesterol is needed. Um, it's used to make steroid hormones like testosterone, estrogen. Cholesterol is also used in the cell membrane um, in order to regulate the correct fluidity of the membrane. And so one of the ways that cholesterol gets into the cells is that these LDLs, these cholesterol carriers, LDLs are gonna carry the cholesterol and LDLs bind to these LDL receptors, these receptors that bind to LDL. And when they bind, it's gonna take the LDL into the cell and out of the bloodstream, and that's gonna allow cholesterol to get into the cell. 
And so LDLs compared to what we call HDLs, LDLs take cholesterol towards the heart. HDLs, so high density lipoproteins, takes cholesterol away from the heart. And so typically you wanna have a lower amount of LDL because you don't wanna take a bunch of cholesterol, a bunch of lipids back to the heart. And you want a higher number, not too high, but a relatively higher number for your HDLs, which are the ones that are gonna take the cholesterol away from the heart. And again, this is referred to as receptor-mediated endocytosis. It allows the cell to take in large amounts of a specific type of ligand. So, class paper for you. Familial hypercholesemia is a genetic disorder in which there are defective LDL receptors. What is the likely outcome? So think about it for a minute, okay? What would happen if somebody was born with defective LDL receptors? What would be the result? So I want you to think about it for a minute and then you're gonna pause it while you're thinking. And when you're ready, go ahead and push play. Okay, so if somebody is born with defective LDL receptors, what that means is that if their receptors don't work properly, they're not gonna be able to take in LDL. And remember, LDL are the cholesterol carrying molecules. And if they can't take in LDL, what that means is that that LDL and therefore that cholesterol is still present in the bloodstream. It's not gonna come out of the bloodstream. And what happens as a result is people who have this condition have genetically high cholesterol because their cells cannot take in the LDL to get it out of the bloodstream. And so because it's not taken up by the cell, it's gonna lead to an increase in LDL and cholesterol in the blood. And if treated, if left untreated, heart disease can occur. So if your parents have high cholesterol, it's always a good idea to get checked because it could be a consequence of not necessarily diet, but it could have to do with just simply genetics. I'm one of those people. I've had high cholesterol ever since I was a teenager. No matter how much I exercised, no matter how uh, well I ate, I always had high cholesterol. And again, that's because I have defective LDL receptors. So it's not that I'm getting too much cholesterol in my diet, it's simply because my cells can't take in LDL and therefore the cholesterol stays in my blood. And so if you happen to have high cholesterol, you wanna go and find that out and get on medication to lower your cholesterol. Now, currently the medication that they prescribe for high cholesterol doesn't really fix the defective LDL receptors. There's not really a good way at the moment to make functional LDL receptors. Instead, what those drugs typically target, if you take like a statin, um, which is like Lipitor, Lovastatin, there's a bunch of them. Basically, those drugs don't target your LDL receptors. Instead, they actually target the liver to stop making cholesterol. Because if you don't make as much cholesterol, that will help to keep your cholesterol down. And so, just something to think about. 